Well, hello, everybody. Happy Sunday night. Welcome to our first ever hook along. This is the Little Foxes hook along. How many little foxes are on? I'm going to see. Um, great to see you all. So this will be the first time that we do this, and we'll probably do this once a month, if you like. Um, and the plan for today, whether you are a beginner or not, is to really, is to hook the whole Little Foxes design from beginning to end right and and it's hard to say how long that's going to take isn't it i mean because my mouth will be running while we do it and i'll be doing a lot of hooking i'll be flipping over and doing some punching at a certain point i'm going to add a few steps to show you so it's going to be like a really full and complete um, program in beginning to end rug hooking so this will be a lot of fun i see some of some of the buddies are on it's not a full show um, so feel free, there'll be f fewer of us than usual. Feel free to jump in anytime. I'm going to keep an eye on the thread the whole time. Happy hooking, Chrissy. Linda Ann, great to see you. It is a beautiful day. Candace, good afternoon. Lucinda, hello, good to see you. And Chrissy and Sharon, hi from Vancouver. Trying to finish your fish rug, fantastic. You're, I bet you're making great progress because you can be working on anything you want right now. A few of us are working on... Uh, little foxes, but you work on whatever you want. You do your stuff, and 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 if you hear something interesting, you can look up. But at least we have each other for company. It's a very fun thing to do, isn't it? I I like the idea of doing these hookalongs, and I'm really curious to see how long it's going to take us to get through this piece. Uh, Doreen, great to see you. Doing really well. Jamie, great to see you. I am. I'm looking forward to this too. I feel so ridiculously relaxed because I because I don't have any commentary right we're just gonna fly by the seat of our pants and hook and I know I know how to do that uh, and punch so I was trying to sort of brainstorm and think of other things that I could tell you and show you during the class of course 99% of what comes out with me always is stuff that I think about on my feet that's just the way that I work the best so I'll also be looking to you at, in the thread for prompts um, hey, Dawn, um, for prompts to see if, if you have questions or you have a, if you have a better way of doing something that I'm doing, I hope that you'll say so because um, I, love, I love to learn new things. And if your way is better, I will be the first one to say, I'm, I'm going to use your way. If your way is better, smarter, easier, um, I'm going to use your way. So you let me know if you, if you have other, other uh, workarounds than I have. Kara, great to see you. You're there from Illinois. Great to see you. I love that little emoji. <laughs> That's so funny. So make sure you have your drink and you come and go as you want, right? Because it'll probably be, um, there's no way it's going to be under an hour. I'm wondering if it's going to be about two hours, right? Let's get started and we'll find out. Make sure you have your water and all your stuff. Um, I am, I am sitting on the couch which is always a very good way to start, right? My dad used to say one of his great dadisms was like he liked to stay in the bed because he'd say, um, well, what really, what could really go wrong while you're like in your bed? Right? It's the same thing with the couch, isn't it? I just realized I did something stupid and I forgot. Um, Jamie, we're not really deciding which colors go where, although you are always at liberty to do that. So I'm going to show you where I'm going to place my colors and if you want to do your colors in a different place, you definitely can because whenever I put out a kit, you have extra of all of the colors. So if you feel like, I see what you're doing there, but I would prefer this. I remember one notable time when I was teaching in person in Maine and I had a moose that I designed especially for that class, M Maine moose, right? Um, I had, the, I had the moose in these beautiful brown colors. I had a bunch of brown colors, so it looked antique with lots of striation. And one of the girls used the blue for the sky to make the moose. And I thought a little bit of the Paul Bunyan, right? The blue ox or something. But I thought, why not? You know, and she put the brown in other places and it was all, um, it was a bit of a mashup. And I liked that one the most out of all of them because I thought that is really thoughtful. Your color placement doesn't have to be the same as mine, but I'm going to show you where I'm going to put mine. And, and then we can, we can go from there. You can make good decisions as you go. Lori, great to see you. Sharon says, I'm pretty much a wreck beginner, so any advice is appreciated. Absolutely. So ask questions as we go to, Don says, in the studio with two cats and a big cup of tea and some time. Those are all great things. Both of the cats, the tea, and the time. I mean, it's hard to even put those in order. I just, I remembered I, I, remembered I forgot scissors, right? That is like one of the key things that one would need. So let me grab a little pair of scissors. Um, I was setting up all my tools like a dentist. 
But I forgot one of those, you know, really important things. Uh, yeah, let me grab these. All right. Am I going to be able to get as comfortable as I was? Let's see. Oh, that's pretty good. All right. So you know what I wanted to show you to get started, and I'm going to move this. I'm going to move our camera as we go. Um, I figured I was just about to transfer my pattern onto backing and I thought, let me just start there. I if you are doing this and you ordered the pattern and you're working on the pattern with me, Lynn, good to see you. And Margaret, good to see you. And Elizabeth, great to see everybody. Dawn, so happy to see you. Oh, you wrote about the cats. Of course, of course. Now I'm picturing your artwork with the cats and the cup of tea. You posted something that said something about a cup of tea. Like earlier this week, it was a quote. It was just so nice, so nice. Um, so yeah, let me get my little bits and bobs out. And I thought, let's let's start at the beginning, right? And I'm not going to belabor an, any of this too, too much because I figure, um, I know not everybody's a beginner and I know not everybody's interested in every part of it, but let's just, let's, let's go at a slow pace while we're together and we have the time, right? So I'm going to start by showing you how I, and I know you know this, and I know a lot of you watch the videos, transfer, because this is the, this is the very piece of fiber tape that I used to transfer all of your patterns, right? And you can see Little Fox is getting a little bit dark because I traced him a bunch of times to do this project together. So just for an FYI, if you are a, fi a fiber tape user, this is a material called fiber tape that's tacky on one side. Uh, not insanely or annoyingly sticky, but it works great. It's actually sometimes called crack stop for walls, and that's why it's available at Home Depot. You have very small pieces, which are not so great for our, our projects unless you do small stuff, but then you get the large ones that are like a yard wide, like wallpaper style with 50 plus yards on it. So I like to use the fiber tape, and just an FYI, if you do make commercial patterns, you plan to have a rug hooking business in the future, you can get maybe... 20 to 30 patterns off of one piece of fiber tape before you have to uh, trace your design again. Because as you can imagine, this is a super simple beginner design, but many patterns have lines that get very thick and then you really can't see them at all. Do you sell fiber tape? Sharon, I think I do. I keep putting it in and out of stock in the store um, because it's one of the products that I don't sell at profit and I'm fine with that. I'm very happy with that because I want to make it available. But sometimes it stresses me out to ship it because some people order lots of yardage and then I've got to fold it and I can't find a box for it. And very often I've lost significant like amounts of money with shipping because it's because I couldn't get it small enough to ship while it weighs nothing. It's like a feather. Um, it's been difficult to ship. So let me let me look let me look at it again because I think I might have turned it out of stock this week just because I had one of those episodes where I shipped a lot of it and I made a loss on it and I thought oh my god this is just such a chain pull at that moment that I think I just clicked it off so let me click it back on because I, I know that for people who can't readily get it or if you don't want you know 25 or 50 yards of it and you want two yards of it um, I think I'm selling it for three something a yard. So after the show, send me a reminder if I forget. I probably, I'll probably remember, um, but I'll put it back in stock. And just know that sometimes the fiber tape, if you get a large quality, I, I fold it into like a square. Doesn't make any difference because mine are just sitting around the studio all the time and they remain sticky, right? I drop them on the floor all the time. I'm a huge pig. They fall, I pick them up, you know, I clean them off and I transfer some more and it works great for a long time. And the only reason I go to another piece, for those of you who are interested in starting a company and stuff, you never know, right? Um, is because the lines get too sort of uh, protracted and stretched and it's not clear enough for me. And that would, that would be when I would go to another piece. Um, another interesting thing to do, this will be my last tip that's real specific for people that are trying to make patterns and sell. One of the good tips for starting your pattern, like if you draw the foxes on a piece of paper, laminate the piece of paper, right? If, if, or send it to a laminator. Luckily, I have a printer downstairs from where I am in the studio here. Um, if you can laminate those papers, then every time you transfer fiber tape onto it to trace, you know, you're not ripping your paper and ripping your supplies, and then you've got ripped up shreds of paper everywhere because it's nice and laminated, and then it sits well and all of that. So let me start over here, and I might drag you close to me. I'm just also going to point out as we go along, um, Sharon says it's $90, okay, Canadian enrolled. That's extraordinary. That's insane. 
um, I will definitely put it back into stock because it doesn't weigh anything. So to ship to Canada, I'll just um, fold it up fairly small so that the shipping remains reasonable because as you know, with Canada, it's the weight and it's the size, um, which I guess in general it is in most places. But in the U.S., with different weights, you get different choices of services. Not not all of those services available for Canada, but we can absolutely make it work. Dunn says, put a limited number of yards. Oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting one because when it's a ton, it is super unwieldy for me. And my instinct is to is to ship it on the roll because I want it to look nice for you. But then if I ship it on the roll, the roll itself weighs a ton, and it's an oversized package, and then I get charged for the oversized package. So I like that idea. That's a great idea. That's some good brainstorming. How do you store your fiber, fiber tape patterns? Candace says, that's a great question. Um, I typically put them onto the paper, and a lot of mine are laminated. I just stick it right on there. And then I, I actually put them in boxes, like from the postal service, and the boxes are marked. Now, I'm st so they're marked like Halloween, Christmas, monthly patterns, absolute beginners, all Klimt, all Monet, there's lots of boxes. And then I have it written on the end of the box what they are. That's the way I ideally store them. But to be honest, if I, if I were to take you on a tour of the studio right now, which I'm not set up to do, you would see a lot of stuff all over the place, not necessarily on the floor, but I tend to be, when I'm in a hurry, which is often, just putting things where they don't belong. Maybe you do that too. I do that a lot. So ideally, I have a system of boxes that are open on one end, and I can read what the idea is, have them alphabeticalized, and I'm putting the laminated pieces with the fiber tape back into each box. Now, if they are much larger than the box, I do have some large boxes too, that I just put them on shelves. Um, I also have a few little pieces of furniture that I use to store the patterns. And I have, um, can you picture like the old record stands that are like wire? You know what I mean? They're like two tier, like from the 40, the era of 45s and 78s and 32 records and all those. Um, and it would be like a wire stand with two tiers and all of these, almost like an envelope sorter, all of these um, little compartments next to each other, like in between the wires. Those are great too if you've got stuff laminated to just like this, because you can put a, more than a hundred of them right next to each other here. And then on the second row, the ones that are slightly smaller. And then it looks really cute, too, because it's like a nice retro um, record, record, you know, record sleeves. It's meant for, like, the record holders. So that's a nice thing, too. And those are readily available, at least around here on um, Facebook Marketplace, because people don't want stuff like that. And it's clunky, and people like records, but they don't necessarily want that record holder. Those things are great to store, even if you're not laminating. If you just have a piece of paper, no matter how big it is, with your fiber tape over it, you can store it flat like that. So that would work really well. Let me just catch up. Um, shipping profiles. Yeah, that's right. That's true, Dawn. That's a good idea. Um, oh, Sharon, I know. I know. I just want to do it economically, and I don't want it to be super expensive for you. And I have to be smart about how I pack it. And sometimes it's different from situation to situation, especially if someone also orders some other stuff and then a quantity of fiber tape, then it can be like, um, oh, how am I going to do this one kind of thing. That's my problem to figure out. And and when I do make losses with shipping and things, it's just par for the course. I, just, I don't cry myself to sleep. Not about that. But, you know, it's it's par for the course. And I figure you win some, you lose some, right? It's all okay. It all comes out in the wash. But no, I know. I just, I want to make it economical and I do want to make them available. Kendra says, my dad was a DJ. We have several of those. Great idea. They're fun. And I love records too. So I love seeing them and I love using them. And they really are great for our purposes because you just need something that's very, very thin to put your thing in there so it doesn't, it doesn't roll up and, or flop all over the floor because then they are very hard to recognize in a hurry. And it is great to have some of your own fiber tape patterns, right? When you draw your own patterns, oh, I'm not an artist. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And when you draw your own patterns on fiber tape, even if they're simple and abstract, you want a nice system for storing them and a system that you like to look at and that's meaningful for you. Because when you look out at your studio space, as you know, and you see a bunch of garbage that triggers you, that's not a good start to the day, is it? That's just like one foot is on the banana peel and the other is in like a state of rage. So make sure that you make good choices and creative choices about how you set yourself up with simple things like this. We don't have a ton of tools in this craft. So it's nice to brainstorm and think about what, what 
each other, you know, maybe doing to do some problem solving. Speaking of problem solving, I don't usually use this frame. I have lots of frames, but I thought this is good for today because it's fairly small. Just a regular frame, right? But I do have this on it. It's not fitting really well. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with it in a minute. But a lot of people say, where do you get these covers for your frames to cover all these angry teeth on your combs that will cut you again and again and again? There's no escape. They will still cut you. But it is nice to put one of these. This one is uh, fleece, like polar fleece. It is nice to put one of these um, sort of sleeves or snugs over your combs. Um, so you can make these yourself because it's basically a rectangle, parallel lines that's connected, right, like into a circle. But I have a square frame, so it's going over the square. Um, I also have circle frames. Do I need a different one for those? No. Nope. This is just a, a length of material. It'll go over a rectangle or a square, oval, anything you got, it's going to go over. Um, but if you don't want to make one and you don't want to buy one, you should maybe go to the local like auto parts store that sells things for like the car. And these are also um, the sizes that they make for steering wheel covers also will work with most of the small and medium frames. So that could be a good thing to do too, a good problem solving thing. So what I want to do first, the reason I have my thing on here and I'm going to bring you here with me is I thought let's do this from the start. Let me take another drink, drink of water here. I feel like I might be getting what the kids have. They've been sick forever. All right. I thought, let's do this from the start, just so you know. And then we're going to get hooking, because I know some of you are thinking, I'm scared to get hooking. I don't think I'm going to be able to keep up. Let's go. We are going to go in just a minute. Incidentally, the reason I'm using this monk's cloth, and this is the one I used this Friday night, this past Friday. Remember when I was doing all the punching um, with all of the vintage shuttle tools and stuff onto the backing? This is what I used. So, um, so I just pulled those pieces out, and I'm using it again here. So I like to reuse, recycle, repurpose. But these little dark lines that you're seeing, it's where I pulled out stuff. And if you make decisions and changes to what you're doing and you pull stuff out of your backing and you just do some of this kind of stuff, it goes right away. It, does it make any difference that I have these weird little scars on my back? Absolutely no difference. It makes no difference at all. So what I do is I take my fiber tape and I position it where I want it. Take my Sharpie, and this is the most important, this is the most important thing of all. Were you just thinking about that? Just thinking about the fiber tape or about how to store the patterns? That would be great. Um, oh, I love it when we're, I love it when we're all in sync. Um, so I've got him squared out. To, how can I tell whether my fiber tape grid, right, because this is a grid. You see all these little squares? This is a grid, like a little window pane. How can I tell whether the lines are straight? A, you know, against my monk's cloth, which is also made up of a grid, right? These are, this is a woven, so it is a grid. Well, I can't tell. Should I put stronger glasses on to see if I could tell? No, that's not going to help. I'm going to need like a microscope. I can't tell. So how do I know that my pattern is squared? Because, and we're going to come to this as we hook, it really needs to be squared. So what I'm going to do, this is the way that I do it. And if you have a better way, you tell me, I'm going to make a little mark on north, south, east, and west on all four corners. I'm not going to make the mark on the corner, right? Because what I'm going to do, let me show you on two sides. I'll just start with these two. I travel, I peel away. I made my two marks. I peel away, and with my very good glasses on, I travel straight up. This is what I do when I make your patterns, too. I do this by hand every time. I don't, I'm not a big fan of the commercial printing not just because of the way the ink smells, but because it's not always exactly on the grid. I drag right across so I know I'm perfectly squared. I'm going to continue doing that, but why, why don't I want to put, and maybe you do, maybe you figured this out, the organizing, that's what I thought you meant. Why don't I want to put dots in the corners, right? What if I put dots in these two corners? Well, if it isn't squared, that's not going to make much sense, is it? Because if it's not squared and I put dots in the two corners and I try to connect them, they might be like this, because it's not squared. That's why I put them in the middle. You know what I mean? I hope that that makes sense. This is all trial and error stuff that I've done. So I kind of drag down, and you know, you do this with whatever. I've got my Sharpie, and I overshot that one. Who cares? This is for me, so I don't really care if my lines are exactly perfect. The thing that I care about the most is that the piece comes out really nice, and that I'm making decisions based on confidence, right? Uh, sometimes I'm overconfident, a bit cavalier about my, my projects and stuff. I just, I go for it a little bit too much sometimes. 
Um, but I think confidence is the thing, isn't it? That having a little bit of confidence and trusting yourself to make good decisions as you go along is what is what is going to help you be a great artist um, or be the artist that who you want to be, whether it's great or not. And, and just solve problems as you go. See to the pants style, right? That's the best kind of problem solving you can do. Now, with this pattern, and let me turn it upside down so you can see it better, because I know I know what I'm doing, but let me show you. With this pattern, you notice, little foxes, that there is a, here's our border, and we know that that's squared, because I just squared it. There's a grid within it as well, right? So I can see there's a corner here, and there's a corner here, and there's a corner here. This corner is covered up with this jigsaw pat piece, right? So I want to be sure that these lines are squared too. I'm not going to take a chance on that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Sharon is saying, I love rug warp for ease of squaring. Absolutely. Rug warp, I think, is the easiest to square on because it's another woven, like monks, like burlap, like linen. But rug warp has such a high texture to it, doesn't it? Um, this is this is like very, it's 100% cotton. It's very smooth. It's very even. It's very measured. But uh, rug warp has a very high kind of nap pile to it, right? The the each each uh, sort of warp and weft thread comes up quite high, and you can your pen just kind of rests along it and, and catches the line very easily, more so because it's so textured than with something like monk's cloth. It's not a reason to use one over the other, uh, but it is an interesting point, and I agree with that completely. Now, because I have an inner square, I want to be really careful about this too. So I'm going to make a mark here, and I'm going to make a mark here. And before I connect those, I'm going to start tracing up. See, I'm just doing things in, an, in a logical order. I'm going to start tracing up the ear because if I have these marks and I start drawing that line, what are the chances I'm going to draw right through the ear? Well, it's, it's, it's at least 100%, isn't it? You know I would. You know I would. And I don't want to. So I'm going to eliminate the things, the shapes that are going to be in the way of what I'm trying to do. This is one of them. I don't want to draw through this either. And I don't want to draw through this. So I'm just let me just eliminate these shapes so that we know those are done. And I've got to deal with this line. And now this is going to be easier to do because I'm just going in between the ears. And I'm going to bring it over here, right, to make the corner, and I'm going to catch this line. And, oh, let me do the bottom ones too, right? Let's do the bottom ones too while we're at it. We can see there's a line here, here. And this line, I don't want to draw over here. You know why? Because I already started it here. And what if I make another mark here, and it's not exactly right, and it doesn't line up with this one? Then I'm going to have some confusion, right? Then I'm going to have a big mess of lines. So instead of doing that, I'm going to peel away, and I'm going to, in my mind and in my hand with my eye, trace this line and connect it to this one. And I do, I do this with your borders, too. Anything you have that's like this. I'm really careful about, and, and Chrissy, I wasn't careful the other day with yours because you had to send me an email and say, am I squared or what? And it was like, nope, that was my mistake. Absolutely, that was my mistake. I screwed that up and I sent Chrissy a pattern that wasn't perfectly squared. And luckily, she's a really good hooker and she realized it and she knew to not force it, um, but to just make this sort of adjustment because I was off. You shouldn't be off, but um, occasionally, I mean, I like to think that I'm perfect, you know, but... In reality, <laughs> you know I'm not. So let me get him back up there, and you see how that border's in there good now. And what are some of the other parts I want to get in there? I want to get I want to get the rest of the face in, so I'm going to trace this up. And if you notice with this pattern, um, one of the things I did here design-wise was I connected like that. I connected the sweep of the face to also sounds awful, but cut off the nose, right? That's like one continual line. That's just, just a designy thing that I thought was cute. And the little eyebrow, and then I'm going to fill in the eyes there. So we're getting there. And then his little body's here like this, his little curled up body. Incidentally, my daughter Jocelyn did this fox drawing, I want to say two years ago. I mean, she's nine now, so this was one of her great creations. I like how with this piece, it's obviously a very simple piece. I think it's really charming. 
I like how she's got the horizon line here and here, almost like he's sitting on a slope. So that would normally be like kind of incorrect, but this is folk art, right? This is folk art. So I have the line like this for you too. And I like that because if I had this right across, then we'd have to deal with, you know, this line disappearing behind his tail, which would be a little bit tricky. This keeps it nice and tidy. So I traced him up and this is what he looks like, right? And when you peel off, you just want to use your Sharpie. Now I'm using a big chisel tip. Um, depending on the pattern that I'm working on, if I'm doing, you know, uh, a lot of people buy the um, vintage postcard stuff, which is very, very, very fiddly, lots of lines. I typically trace my pattern first onto fiber tape with the chisel tip, which are these big markers, right, with a big tip. And then with, with fussy patterns like those, I, um, I switch to the fine tip, not the ultra fine, right? The, just the fine tip. The ultra fine's like ridiculous. So this works great for us. The lines that I feel aren't dark enough, I touch up later with my Sharpie. I'm always gonna be someone who, right? And you should be too. I'm always gonna be someone who, if I want to, I might do other stuff to this pattern. Now I, I won't work, I won't do crazy off, you know, on a bender things now. Uh, in class because we all have the same pattern. But just as an idea, if you wanted this to be a larger pattern, right, and, or you have a special frame, maybe you have like a pretty antique or a vintage frame, and it's larger than this, and you think, oh, if only there was a little more room on the sides, if, you know, it, that I could make it fit, pop it right into that frame with no glass, wouldn't that look nice? If that's the case, right, then you might want to say, well, my frame is this big, right, and then you just take the Sharpie out and you add more lines always stay on the grain right but say oh my frame is going to be and this is just an example i don't have a frame but my frame is this big right so i'm just going to have the confidence to take my sharpie out and maybe i want to continue lines like this right and make another border so that it fits into a different frame i'm not going to hook this with what we're doing i'm just giving you the idea that this sharpie is a tool and this is as, as important as your hook or your punch uh, when you are designing, make the decisions about the lines. If you don't like this here, take it out and put the line right through it. If you wish there was another one of these here, take a Sharpie out and put one right here, right? Use use your markers and, and make your design the way that you want it. Even if it's my pattern, who cares? It's your design, it's your time, and it's your finished piece. So it, you owe it to yourself to make it just the way you want it. Now, I'm going to put Little Fox onto the frame. We're going to hook him in just a minute, and I'm going to bring you closer to my hands. I'll be back and forth with my face, too. Um, but I think I'll mostly be with my hands and my mouth. Let's see. Now, I'm going to get him as tight as I can on here, as tight as a drum, they say, right? If you can't get it tight as a drum, you get it pretty tight. Why do you want it tight as a drum? Well, when it's tight as a drum, all these little holes in the weave open better and it's easier to pull the loops up or push them down, depending on whether you're punching or hooking. That's why it's as tight as a drum, right? It makes it easier for you. Now, just so you know, for your own pattern making, I don't know if you can tell, but I always, when I have the edge of my pattern raw, right, from cutting it, I always zigzag stitch. I always zigzag, and I, and I have it in a natural color. I buy the big, big, big spools from Joann's. Um, it's all like many shades of tan, right? They do like all these good, like folky colors and Americana colors. So I have a zigzag stitch, and for my machine, um, I put it on the zigzag stitch, and I put it on number um, three, three point five to four, so that the stitches are quite far apart, right? Because I don't want to use the entire spool of thread making a crazy zigzag that is as formidable as like a buttonhole stitch, right? Super close together, super packed and tight. I don't need that for this. I just want to be sure that my ends aren't going to come undone. So I do a little zigzag stitch around and I, and I want to conserve my thread, right? I don't want to be buying that every week. It's like $10 for a spool. Um, Sharon says, I think it's a good idea to have at least uh, four inches around the design to accommodate changes. I completely agree with that. For me, I don't on this one because it's for me. But normally when I send out patterns, particularly larger patterns, I put at least four inches because I don't know what you're going to do with it, right? I don't know if you mean to put uh, more around the border. And I like to give you that option. So f four is usually my minimum. Um, sometimes it's a lot more. Or if I'm at the end of the bolt or whatever, then it's sometimes way bigger. Um, and a blank canvas, right? It's like a fine kind of fiddly line. A blank canvas sometimes is a bit overwhelming. 
But I figure rather than throwing stuff in the trash, I'd rather give you whatever I have left, right? But big borders are better because then you can make these great choices, right? It might be that if your piece is big enough, you want to add like quite a bit to it or one big border on the side, right? Isn't it nice when you add something like this, right? I swear I'm going to stop. And I don't want to confuse you with the pattern, but I'm doing this by eye, right? So we're not particularly squared. But what if I wanted to do one of these traditional rug hooking fun times things here, right? And what if I wanted to do like this kind of a border just on the two sides? You know, when you see something like this just on the two sides, right? Like a book plate. What if I wanted to do one of those and I wanted to do like, um, well, let's, let's go for the low hanging fruit and do the date. Now, I'm using this time to remember what year it is. It's 2023, isn't it? If I wanted to do something like this. Right? That would be fun. Or if I wanted to put my initials, or I wanted to put welcome, spring, or um, anything, you know? So it's nice to have that extra border space because you can, you can add bling. Now, hopefully this doesn't distract you from our focus, right? So... Let me do this. Let's take out our packet. And I want to do just a quick absolute beginner's intro for people who have not hooked at all before. Let's do an absolute beginner. And sorry, I dropped my scissors. It'll be the first of 100 times I dropped them, right? This is my teaching frame. So I'm going to bring you in a little bit closer. This is my teaching frame. And um, it's a window pane, right? So your frame does not look like this. The reason I'm on this frame is so I can show you, oh, and I have a big hook, so I'm gonna use my crochet hook. Um, I'm using a Hartman hook to hook today. So this is a really big one. Well, it might, no, I think that's too big for that. I'm gonna use my crochet hook to demonstrate. Um, and yeah, crochet hooks are fine. If that question comes up, crochet hooks are fine. This is a number seven, which is a 4.5 crochet hook, but my favorite hook for rug hooking is a 3.5 millimeter. Um, but this is a seven and this is a clover and this works great too. So I just want to show you what my hands are going to do if you are a complete beginner, right? And you ignore me if you are not and you're like, get going, will ya? I'm going to just take a piece of the orange because I've got that. That's going to be the fox color orange. Take it out of my pack. And I'm going to show you what my hands do. And you decide whether this is useful for you or not. Now, I always start teaching classes by saying, when you are a rug hooker, right, you tend to grab your hook with your dominant hand, which for me is my right hand, I'm right-handed. And with this craft, as with many, the dominant hand um, is gonna hold your tool, my hook, my crochet hook in this case. Now, unfortunately, with rug hooking, it's your other hand that does the really hard work, the heavy lifting. It does the tricky part. My left hand, that is not my dominant hand, is going to be coming under here. And when I put my hook in, right, to pull up a loop, it's this hand under here, the dum-dum, right? This is the smart hand up here that's just going like this, like a machine. This is the dum-dum under there that has got to wrap the end around the crook, right, around the crook. This is the crook in here. The dum-dum hand has got to wrap the wool strip or the yarn in the crook and pull it, and then this hand just pulls up. This hand just does da 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 And this hand is the one that's doing all the fiddly twisting. I'm leaving the tail on top. Why am I leaving the tail on top, front and back? Well, just so I don't pull it back through, right? Because if I leave the tail under and this dummy hand is under there, reaching for things and touching things, what are the chances he's going to pull? It's 100%. It's 100%. You're going to accidentally pull your pieces out. So when I'm rug hooking, I am putting my hook into my backing. My left hand, because I'm right-handed, is wrapping the yarn or the strip around the crook. It's caught in the crook. And then I pull it up. I do my first one by leaving the tail up a little bit. And then I go to my next hole. And I do the same thing. I wrap and pull up, wrap and pull up, wrap and pull up hundreds of times until you're there, right? And then you decide when you pull up, um, are my loops good? Are they a good height? Yeah, if they're a good height for you, they're a good height. Are they perfect? I don't know. Mine are never perfect, and it never bothers me that they're not perfect. Does it bother you if your loops are not perfect? 
if it does, then then that's one of the things you know you've got to work on is making your loops more perfect. Because if you agonize over the height of your loops, you are a technical person. You are m more technical than I am. And if th there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but when you're a technical person, it does bother you when your loops are not perfect. And you have to honor that. You have to honor that. You can't just go, oh, forget it. I don't care. Good enough. Because then you're going to look at it later and say, oh, my God, look at my loops. I don't want to show anybody my work. My loops are awful. Don't do that to yourself. If you know that you are a technical person, honor the way that you work and work harder on the parts that are important to you. If perfect uniformity is important to you in the height of your loops, work on that. It's not going to come immediately, but it will come, hopefully sooner rather than later. Right? If that's not important to you, you just move on. Right? Do I put a hole in every loop? No, you don't. On a window screen, you would, because this is a huge open gauge. Um, so Janelle is saying, how do you know how close to space your loops? That is the thing. That is the thing. Janelle, you only know from practicing. Because when you put your loops, and every backing is different, so it's not like I could ever say, I'm going to come back to you in person for a minute. It's not like I could ever say to myself, I'm going to hook two holes and skip hook to skip or one, two, two, one, like it's Morse code. It'll never work like that because every time you get a different pattern, if it's on different linen and you're like, oh, I always get linen, it'll be different linen with different companies. I promise it will. Those will be different gauges and different backings. Every, it'll be different every time. So you, you can try to formulate um, a very mathematical pattern or rhythm for um, do two, skip one, do two, skip one, but it won't be universal and you won't be able to carry that formula from project to project. So you just have to build the confidence and get used to trusting your eye and for your eye to say, um, these are too close together. And you know how I can tell they're too close together? Because this whole section looks like it's buckling, right? Should I pull them out? It's, it's a case by case, isn't it? Maybe don't pull it out if it's a small area, right? We don't we don't pull out unless it's a four alarm fire, right? Because this is folk art. But if it's driving you crazy, you might have to pull it out. If if the if you're too spaced out between loops, you can see the backing in between. Th that's called holidays when you have little holes and you can see the backing. Those are holidays. You don't want them too spaced out so that you have holidays, but you don't want them so close that they are re making your material super super dense and wanting to buckle. So you want the, the sort of three bears, Goldilocks, happy medium. Um, but that you can only figure out by practice. And I promise that you will be able to see. And each person does hook differently, right? Some of us pack always. But they, I will probably be packing until death, which I hope is very far away because I'm a big packer. Other people, not so much. They have tons of holidays, and they finish their pieces with holidays, and you can see a little bit of backing here and there, and it doesn't bother them at all. Most people are in the middle. Um, but this is something you have to gauge for yourself because packing can create a physical problem with the piece where it doesn't sit well. Holidays, not so much, right? You might see bits and pieces of backing. Um, like Pierre Sylvain, he often has holidays in his work. And for me, it adds to the impression of the speed that he works at. And it's a huge plus. I like the way it looks. It, I like to look at paintings where you can see a little bit um, of the canvas behind. It shows process. I like that. Other people don't. So these are kind of moving target questions that don't have a fixed answer. So I'll tell you what the choices are. I'll show you how I do it. Um, but you will figure out for yourself your, your three bears, um, happy medium, right, between packing and to loose slut track, right, to loose too many holes, right, hooking too loose. Sharon says, question on a script. Um, is it a good idea to hook the letters first with slightly larger strips or yarn to act as a placeholder and then take it out exactly when ready? That's exactly what I do. That's exactly it. I will hook, for example, um, this is cut all to number seven, this kit. If I had text that I was going to do or the number, the year 2023, I'd probably hook it in an eight or a nine strip. And I'd hook around it. And let me show you what I mean here. Pretend I was hooking a number, right? I hook the number first and then I hook around it. Why would I do that? Well, because when you hook around it, all these little filigree parts, like little numbers and letters, get squished. 
right? And, and the loops get quite deformed. Um, so with all that squishing, you lose the crispness of those, those letters or numbers or whatever filigree kind of lines you have going. So you hook first, and then you hook around. Your, the part that you're worried about is inevitably going to get um, squished. And then you pull it out, right? And I would have hooked around it. Don't pull, don't pull a lot out at once, because as soon as you pull out, your loops go and bury the part, right? So just pull out bit by bit. And you'll say, okay, this is, I, I know this is just where I pulled out. This is where I'm going to add loops. And you can either hook in the thing you just pulled out or hook in something a little bit smaller because hooking in a larger size first is not a must, but it gives it a little bit of breathing room, right? Because it's a little bit bigger first. So that is a great, that is the only technique um, that I use when I am um, hooking a placeholder, right? hooking something fine in filigree. That is the only technique I use, is to do placeholders. Don says, I like to vary the height uh, of your loops. Don, I saw that about your work. I like that too. That is my favorite style of hooking. I like variety. I like it when, um, I do, I'm do. i not personally a fan of, of great uniformity because I feel like I can buy that at home goods. I like things to look handmade. I like to choose what things I want to hook a little bit higher. Different materials, whether it's wool, yarn, plastic bags, anything, quilt material, it's all going to come up differently, right? So it will be up to you to decide what kind of height you want. Just remember that when you are putting a pattern together for this fox's body, this looks like, oh, that's not much, is it? I'm not talking about the head right now, but just this part. I'm going to need four times this much to make this piece filled in, right? It's really three, but I always say four and I always kit for four just in case you're a high hooker because I don't know if you're a high hooker. And if you're a high hooker, you need more like four, right? But most people, you need about three times more. So that's something you need to figure out about yourself when you're dyeing or kitting your own stuff. Um, Sharon says, thank you, that's what, yeah, well, that'll help a lot, including runes. Oh my gosh, that sounds really cool, Sharon. Let me know what you're working on. I love runes. That sounds really magical. It is magical. So, um, right, so that's how we figure out, it's a little bit harder with yarn, right? I just, with yarn, I get used to hooking with yarn, and I know, um, how like I know how big I make a ball like does a does a 50 yard ball fill this much or is this more like a 25 yard that's something I figure out as I go but all of these numbers right all of these um, measurements for amounts will depend on whether you hook at kind of an average low or high height these are things we figure out about ourselves as we go so let me get started and I'm going to keep an eye on the time because we haven't even started yet well we, we really have right now, I'm looking at my box of treasures here. This is the bag that you got, too. And you can see we've got, if you're doing this with me, we've got a little bit of the white color, right? This is like a little bit of a creamy vanilla color. Um, I can't even remember. Oh, for the tip of his tail, I think, and for under the eyes. And then I've got two colors of the red, right? This one that's a bit more like a ginger and um, or like a um, cinnabar. And then this one that's a bit more orange. Uh, so that's a dark and a light. And then I've got the really dark tweed, right? This is going to be tougher to hook with because this is a patterned wool. But this is a challenge too and we're together so we can make it work together. That anything tweedy or patterned is always going to be a little bit trickier to hook, right? It wants to fray more easily. We're going to work through that together, right? We're going to make it work. And it sheds a lot too. And then I've got this, oh, I love this one. This is one of the hand-dyed rainbow ones that I did um, for one of the edges, one of the blobs. And I'm going to have to remember as I go, it's a little bit of a pastel tie-dye, very pale, very pretty. And then I've got these two, the, uh, these are both hand-dyed. This, this is slightly thicker. This is the Briggs & Little. I think this is a three-ply mix of colors, right? We've all got the same two colors. Do you dye all your strips? Sharon, I mostly do. I dyed all of these except for the printed one. And the reason I have to dye my strips is because I make so many kits. And when I don't make kits, and this is a great question, the reason I've enjoyed working on, and I'm currently working on the Design Like book, um, I, 
for books, I make my own patterns that I'm going to do one of, and, and then I know that I can use whatever I want. I can use a scarf or a necktie that I've been dying to use, but I can't use it for a prototype like this because I will never have enough of it to kit. And people will look at the piece and say, I want exactly what you did, and they have every right to have exactly what I did, but I can't do it twice. So for that reason, being in business, I dye pretty much everything so that I can make it again if there's like a big rush on a specific pattern or kit. But when I'm doing stuff for funsies for myself, I, I sometimes use my own dyed stuff, but I'm more of a magpie and I'm looking for stuff to cut up because um, that's what I prefer. So first for this, uh, with the exception of the tweed, these are all things that I dyed. So let's look at this together and let me figure out where I meant to put some of these pieces and let's get going. I'm going to bring you a little bit closer to me. And let's see. All right, so the fox is going to be orange without a doubt. The nose is going to be that dark tweedy color and the eyes. I definitely want some definition between. Okay, this has already resolved itself. If you look at this pattern, I was just thinking to myself, of the two um, sort of oranges that I have, they're very different, right? One is very um, light, kind of like a, more like a pumpkin color. And then this one is much darker, the one that's more like the really gingery color. Now, I was thinking, how am I going to make that work? I want there to be some definition between the fox's, now this part is white, between the fox's head and body, right? So my first thought, because I haven't worked on this pattern for a while, and I'm not showing you the one that I hooked already because it's different colors and it's going to be confusing. Let's do this one and let's do this together. So I'm thinking, do I need to outline my whole fox just to separate the body from the head? You know what I mean? So it's not like one continuous color. And then I realized Jocelyn, my daughter, is a very good designer because we don't need to do that. Because if you think about it, this is going to be orange, right? His little forehead, little T-zone. And then this is going to be orange. But these two things don't touch, right? Because here, the nose is in the way. And here, the white cheeks are in the way. So we can actually choose one of these colors and just hook with it. So why don't we go for, I'm going to go for the darker red. So if you're working with me and you want to work in exactly the same colors, I'm choosing the darker red. And I've got them tied up for us. So I'm, I'm looking to untie mine. And I'm going to start with the fox's little body and face. And if you're hooking it too and you're thinking, I don't want to start with that. I want to start with something else. And, and, and you don't mind if we don't work together, if we're just spending time together, but we don't do exactly the same thing at the same time. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, this is another beginner question, right? This is a very beginner question. Um, sh am I supposed to hook the center first? Well, no, not necessarily. And I say this every time. You might be one of the puzzle makers of the world, and you might want to hook the border first, right? And if that's the case, you should. Right. I want to hook. I tend to hook what my favorite color is first. So and, and for me right now, the fox is the main motif. So I tend to want to hook like the central thing or my favorite color. So that's what I'm doing this time. But you could do whatever you wanted. You absolutely could. So I'm going to take let me take one more sip, a little a little bit of water. And let's start hooking. I'm going to hook the body first. No, I'm going to hook the face first. I'm going to hook the face first. All right, let's go. So I'm going to put this little trinket on there. This is one of my magnets. I've got a few of these guys. These are called needle nannies, right? They're more for sewers to put a sewing needle on, but they're extremely strong. It's, I like to have this on my piece um, so I don't drop my hook or my scissors. And I'm going to show you how it works. The Hartman hook will not stick to it, so that's always a bummer. But what it does is this, right? You put it, I got the magnet on the back that I took off, and you just put it here, and it, I mean, I can't even move it, really. It's really there. And if you have a hook that sticks, I mean, these won't, these won't stick, right? The metal is not such that it would stick. But normally, if I'm hooking with one of my other needles uh, hooks, they stick. And certainly, these guys will stick. So I know my scissors are, there's, it's really hard to get them off. Needle nannies, right? These are great to use. So I'm holding my, I'm holding my um, hook anyway. And I might switch to the, I might switch to the, crochet hook. We'll see how it goes, but I'm going to get started here. So I'm underneath just the way I was a little while ago, putting my hand under there. I'm going to, I'm going to start here and I'm going to run this line up like this, right? And then I'm going to come like this. So you can travel with me if you want. And 
here comes another question that I just resolved for myself. Do I hook inside the lines, outside the lines, or on the lines? And I think the universal answer to that among all teachers is it does not really matter, but you have to pick one and stick with it. Because if you start hooking inside the line and then you switch to outside the line, your lines and thus your pattern are going to become a little bit wobbly. And it might not look as crisp or as correct because um, you've, you've messed with the lines a little bit, if you see what I mean. Now, I might be hooking faster than you, so do not worry about it. This is also online for you, so you can go back to this later. If you just stick with me for parts of it and maybe plug colors in later as we go, um, we will never all be on the same page time-wise with the way that we hook. And I'm probably slow compared to some of you. Um, and and there, it isn't a race, right? It's not a race. So it absolutely does not matter. We hook at our own speed. We think our own thoughts. You know, you, you, you're happy doing what you're doing and you've arrived, right? Now, I'm coming to the edge. And do I want to have this last loop in? And I just pulled them out. Or do I want to start heading up this way? Well, I want to start heading up this way. And I could pull up the loop and try to twist it to face this direction now so it'll come up here with me. But it's not really going to work because if I do that, it's going to look a bit funny on the corner of the eye. What I'm going to do to resolve this part of the pattern is pull up that last loop on the edge of the temple and I'm going to trim it. It's good to choose the pair of scissors that don't cut, right? That's excellent. That's me. So I trim that there. I've only got a little bit left, but you know, I use absolutely everything. I use everything. And then I'm going to come in right next to it, and I'm just going to start hooking up. Right. Now, what do you do with all your little tails that are hanging out on top as you go? Well, you can trim them perfectly if you want to uh, as you go, or you can trim them all at the end. Some people, and this is just a, a how do I work versus how do you work thing, some people like to trim perfectly as they go, like manicure the lawn as they go, and, and I'm one of those people. And other people are like, no, nah, not playing that game. I'm going to do it all at the end. I know I, get, I have to set aside some time at the end because um, it's going to be a little project, but that's, that's how I want to do it. I, I only fuss with one thing at a time. I'm not going to fuss with that as I go. You decide what's right for you. So I'm just... Continuing on here, now I cut that tail, right, where my I only had that little bit left. When I start my next strand, I always, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, this is this is the way I work, and you it's a take it or leave it, I always go back into the same hole as the tail and put the next tail in. Because I figure two halves equal a hole, right? Two tails equal a whole loop. So I figure that's gonna look it's gonna look pretty good. And I'm just shooting straight up into the ear. Am I going into every hole? I've got monk's cloth. Um, nope. I go into, in my case, I'm probably going into two or three holes in a row and then I'm going to skip a hole. Um, and again, that's only something that I figured out over time. And when I, when, I'm going to stop here actually because I'm going to show you something different. When I have a different material, I'm going to rethink that. So you can see I'm coming to the point of the ear right now. I'm going to show you two different things. Oh, let me catch up. Um, oh, Candace says, I find I can't see over the talls at some point. Yeah, that's a good reason to clip as you go, because you do get like wild, wild jungle pieces that are like too high up, right? Um, that's a good reason to clip as you go. Are my loops even? They're absolutely not. Is my life even? Is my brain even? No, definitely not. So my loops are not going to be even either. Um, you make yours as, as even as they need to be for you, right? And never judgment. If you're like, I like them all over the place, or I like them really, I'm uptight, I like them really methodical, it's good to know that about yourself and honor that. Now, I'm coming right to the edge of the ear, right? And there's two different ways that I can do this. I'm going to come this way a little bit so you can see the ear a bit better. And let me bring the camera even closer. Hang on a second while I take out my sweater off. Hot, cold, hot, cold. This is menopause. All right, hang on. See, I think this is all part of the same thing, isn't it? Little sip. Oops. 
so I've got I've got two little sharp ears here right so let me think about what to do about this I'm gonna hold on this one right now because I'm mid a mid uh, strip over here I'm gonna show you one way to do this and I'm gonna show you another way to do this one this is um, the technique I'm about to show you to do this little sharp part of the ear this very acute triangle is something that this is a take it or leave it right bag of tricks take it or leave it I want something really sharp in this little point right here I don't want like a series of loops or one big clunky loop that's facing both directions I want to do something smart what I do is I take my strip fold it over it doesn't have to be in half at all but fold it over um, mine is like this where's the camera mine is like this and I'm going to with it folded over like this, right? Sorry, like this. I'm going to come back under here in that tippity tip. I'm going to pull up the loop the way that I want it. I want one loop like this for the tip. I'm going to pull it up like this. And now underneath, I've got two strips hanging down, right? Two different strips. I'm going to take one, right? Leave the other one for the moment. I'm going to take one. I can feel that it's on this side. So I'm going to take that one and I'm going to hook down from there. See what I mean? I'm not done with that yet, but my hand is reaching for the other one. This is the one I was just working. I'm going to take this one now. This is the other one. And I know that that one's meant to come over here, down this side of the ear. So I'm going to hook them down there. And I'm going to get at the top. I'm not going to get a ratty tail. I'm going to get one nice crisp loop. This is good for the tips of ears, for the points of stars, for all kinds of little things that you got going. It's good for anything that has an acute angle happening. Do you see, sometimes my hands as I hook, I pull, I pull up a loop and then I pull it right back out. Well, it's because I didn't like it, right? If I don't like it, I want to get rid of it pretty fast. And, you know, you make those calls as you go, too. I'm back under here. I, I hooked that one to completion, so I'm back under here. And I'm just going to finish up the side of his face here. Come shooting down here. And again, if you're working with me, don't panic if I'm going faster than you. It ain't worth it, right? We, that's not what we're here to do. You do as much as you can, drink in as much as you can, and you can look later and see, okay, what did she do when she got down to the eye? That kind of thing. I am down to the eye. I'm going to flip you back over. I'm down here now, and I've got this one little loop up here, which I like a lot. It made a nice, crisp... Made a nice crisp top here, right? I like that. Um, and I'm down here now, right? So I want to be a little bit careful because this is the edge of the eye. I've only got a little bit of the tail left. I think I'm just, in this case, going to pull it up and trim it the way that it is and leave it. Because I know that later I can kind of turn this. You see what I mean? Once it's got loops on this side and on this side I can turn it so it's just perfect right here really good sharp point you know now I'm over here at this other ear and oops let me turn around again we're gonna be thorough might as well be thorough huh get rid of this pillow that's driving me nuts um, so I'm over here at this ear and I'm not going to do it the same way. I'm going to do it in a different way because I want to show you there's more than one way to do everything. I'm bringing the loops right up to the tippity tip of the ear and I could just come up here and trim. Right. So that makes a nice sharp point too. If I, if I do that with the edge of the ear, just like the side of the face here, I'm going to want, as I hook around it, I'm going to want to keep that nice point there. Right? That'll be just as nice as this. It's just a different way. And then I'm going to come in to complete it. See how I'm, I'm not coming in on top at the tip of the ear. I'm stuck. I'm not coming in up here because that would make, I'd kill the beauty of that little point, that one little piece sticking up. I don't want to kill that. So I have to come down a little bit lower on the ear, just a little bit lower. 
and I'm going to leave the tail resting up against the loops and I'm going to come shooting down the side. Same as before. It's just a different technique. Which one is better? Does, neither is better. Which one is better for you? That's the question. That's the only question that matters. Which one is better for you? doesn't matter which one is better for me. Which one is better for you? Do I always leave my loops on top, uh, the tails on top? You know, I usually do because I don't want to accidentally pull them out. But uh, sometimes I don't. And the reason I don't when I choose not to is because, hang on, I'm in an awkward position here. I might have to move. Let's see. I'm just trying to shoot across here. Um, the reason I sometimes don't leave my tails on top is because where there are areas where there's lots of stopping and starting and you have lots of ends sticking out, maybe there's lots of color changes, there's lots of stopping and starting, hence there are lots of tails, hence there is the possibility of that area looking quite ratty, just ratty with lots of little tails sticking up. Now, right there again, I put my tail into the lat with with the last tail I cut into the same hole. I don't um, I don't leave the tails up if I'm working on an area where I feel like all I can see is tails and it looks ratty. Then I do not leave my tails up. I make decisions as I go. I have the confidence to make decisions as I go. I trust myself. If it looks ratty, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to add another tail to the rattiness, right? So I'm going to leave the tail underneath. Got to decide as you go, and this is what building confidence is about. So, all right, let's see. Let me come. Let me bring you a little bit closer. Still, I want to be sure you can see me pretty good. There we go. That's all right. All right. Oh, let me see. I'm not happy with that either. There we go. All right. Now remember this line is from the demo I did the other night, so don't worry about that. Now where am I? I'm I'm here. Yep, I'm here. So let me cut that and let's finish filling in his little head. I can see there's another question, so let me see if I can get there. Now I am, it is a little bit ratty in some parts of it, so I am trimming as I go. This is a bit of like a patterned wool, not color-wise, but texture-wise it's a bit different. So where there's like little bits um, sticking up that are not quite even and perfect, I'm not going to agonize about those bits. I'm really not. Um, once all the areas around it are filled in, it's going to be absolutely beautiful. Jamie says, so what is the trick for a quick release when you pull up with the hook facing in a particular direction? I find it a struggle releasing the loop. I just brought it up. I see what you mean. It might be that it might be the hook. Um, sometimes I have that with the Hartman hooks, right? These are not my favorite hooks, but this is the one that I had in the studio today that was handy. So I'm using it. Sometimes it's actually the hook in combo in tandem with the backing, right? So for me, this hook keeps getting stuck. And that's just, um, it's, it's the hook and the monk's cloth combo. Sometimes the hook, this hook I feel works better with linen, but I'm on monk's cloth today and this is the one in my hand, so I'm going to go for it. But it's probably not you, right? So there's a lot of things with this craft that it's like it's, it's not you, it's me. It's not you. It's going to be a combo of the tool that you're using, whether it's the tool itself or it's the tool in, in tandem with the backing. It's that, but it's not you. So it might be that you want to change hooks, right? Sometimes I switch to a different hook. This is maybe too, this one is too tight. That's why I like the 3.5. I'm going to stick with the Hartman. But that's why I often change hooks um, from project to project because of these things. And also, you know, with different thicknesses of wool strips, I get different results. So it's a tool thing. It's definitely a tool thing. I'm just remembering inside the ear here is like that little black line. So, you know, I think I'm going to grab a piece of the black and I think I'm going to do that next. Now, I'm anticipating that the black does have a raggy factor to it. So my choices, knowing that, are do I want to cut the strip a little bit? Do I want to cut it so that it's thinner and this makes a thinner line in here? I could do. I don't know. I don't know that I will. It, it is an option. It's an option for you, too. Um, I think I'm just going to go for it. And I don't even know if I want to put the full V in. Let's see how it goes. Because this is a number seven cut. Always remember that as you're going, you absolutely can 
cut your strips, right? Just because I gave you sevens doesn't mean they have to remain sevens. You could cut them much, much, much skinnier. The black one could play you if you cut it too skinny because it's a tweed and it will want to unravel. I think for myself, I'm just going to leave that little bit of dark there. I might have to get a light. It's, it's really light in here, but it doesn't look like it's super light for you. Let me see how it goes. I'm going to push back a little bit. Hang on. Now maybe that's good for a little while longer, and then I'll switch it out. So I've got a little bit of black in the corner of the ear. And I'm kind of feeling like a dentist searching for a cavity. I'm kind of feeling uh, where the hole is back here, right? Because I don't want to pack, but I don't, I'm not going to have a holiday if I can't see it with my eyes, right? That I'm definitely not uh, in a holiday situation. But I'm looking to find where my next stitches are going to go. And finding them, I'm filling it in. I'm kind of at a crossroads now where you can see I'm coming down here, but there's a bit of a gap right here. So I'm kind of going to swing around off to the side and start filling in here. And do you have to go in exactly the same lines I am to fill the face in? Not, not at all. Not at all, right? We look at so many pieces on Coffee Time where people have done all kinds of different fills, all kinds of thoughtful directional hooking. You don't have to do this at all. Now I'm right around the eye here, so I'm making good decisions as I go so that I don't kind of intrude too much on this nice round shape, right? I don't want to have too much material in the way that nice white part of the eye. I think what I'm going to do is what I did here, and I'm going to come shooting up from the nose. I think I'll come across here first, right? I'm going to try to complete his, and let me bring you closer again. Just fool in with the camera. You know me and fool in with the camera. Um, let's see. Is this good? I'm going to need to change it out a lot, right, as we go. And hang on. Just making sure that's not good. It's always funny. The camera's reversed. It's always funny to me. Like, I, it's, it's never intuitive where I think I'm supposed to be with the camera. All right, that's better. So I think I'm going to come. I'm over at the tip of the nose here. I'm going to come sideways. I'm going, I'm going west. Westward. Westward ho. Going west. Cross the little nose. That's not too many stitches because it's a little nose. Now my hand underneath is about to twist. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? My hand, oh, it's right under the logo. My hand underneath, oh, wow, it's really right under the stupid logo, right? Hang on. I'm going to, because I want to turn the corner, I'm actually going to twist the wool strip like this. Like I'm turning it counterclockwise. I'm twisting it like that with my hand because I want to encourage the loop to come up, not in the normal way, like this. Sometimes people hold their loop like that. I, hold, I do this, but whatever you do is, is right for you, right? People do all these things. I do this, but right now I'm doing this because I want to try to force. the. This loop is good where it is at the bottom of the nose, but now I want to go north. And I'm twisting because I want to try to force the orientation of the loop to turn upward so that all of these loops are pretty and um, directionally sound, like facing the right way, so that they look big and fat and, and they look like they're headed the right way. If you are a beginner and, and I just did that, you tried to do that underneath with your hand and you thought, my hand does not want to twist, well, that's something that, that you know you have to practice, right? If, if, um, if I was playing Twister with my kids, I wouldn't win, would I? I'm, my hands and my body are not that supple at this moment. Um, mine may be more than yours because I, I hook more or I have hooked more. But you know that all these little things that you might want to pull on later, like being able to twist loops from underneath your backing fabric, these are things you might want to do in the future. And these are things you know in the back of your mind, I will get it. I will get it in the end. Might not be today that I'm doing like these every technique perfectly. Might not be tomorrow. Might be, but it might not. Uh, and you just you just have to be at peace with that, right? You figure it out as you go. Coming in to close a little eye right here, and I'm going to trim that because it looks too bulky. Let me get rid of him. And let's see. I'm going to come down here now into the tip of the nose. And 
In a couple of minutes, I'll go get the light. I should have thought of that. I thought with the daylight savings, you know, that, um, oh, that was the end of the tail, that, it, you know, it is light longer, but it's still, it's still getting a little dark. So I'm right here. Pull you right here with me. I'm right here. And I'm coming right up the nose. A little snout, huh? Cute little guy. Hardly ever see foxes anymore, which is okay for me because we have a little Yorkie. And I don't know that a fox would go for a little dog, but I don't know that it wouldn't. Um, so it makes me nervous. I've heard of foxes going for cats many times. Had that happen years ago. Would not want to repeat that, particularly with the kids around. So that would be that would be a cat ran away living on the farm kind of a story. If that ever happened, God forbid. So I'm kind of following as I go up the arch of the eye, right? That nice round bit over the eye. And let me see. I'm going to catch up as I go. Jamie says, I have the same, um, Jamie says, so what's okay. And Sharon says, I have the same problem as Jamie. I find pulling up at a shallow angle sometimes helps, but not always. Yeah. I mean, you can try pulling up at a shallow angle is just levering less, right? Cause it's all about levering. Am I levering high like a seesaw or am I level leveling less? Different techniques, different people hold in different ways and have different ways of levering up. Some people hold like this. 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 So depending on you, how you hold will sort of dictate how much control or how much difference it might make when you pull a loop up at a different angle. Um, I feel like the way that I hook, holding it kind of like a pencil, I don't get, I don't feel it makes a big difference um, whether I pull up shallow or I pull up dramatic, you know, big, much bigger flourish, much bigger loop. Um, but for some people it does. And it, again, has to do with the body, with how your body's working, because it's not the same as mine. We're all pulling up loops, but we're all working, we're all doing it differently. And, um, oh, okay, thanks, Jay. Jay's going to come and put the light on for me, I think. Thinking about your question, okay, Cats Gallery, yoga helps the body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yoga definitely helps the body. I am loving yoga. I try to do I try to do it at the gym as much as possible. Right now I put on a goodly amount of weight. So I'm doing more cardio stuff um, to try to like take a layer of lard off and a little bit less yoga time wise. But as soon as I feel like I have a normal shape again and I'm not like a huge thundering hippo, right? That's just me being me, comparing myself to myself. Um, I'm going to get back into the yoga because that helped with everything. It helped with sleep. It helped with hand stuff. It helped with everything. Um, nice technique. Doreen says, Deanna, how do you decide what width will you should use for the projects? So that's a great question, Doreen. I know you know the answer to that too. So that's a great prompt. So the typical, um, well, uh, there's, that's kind of a twofold and I'm going to keep hooking the forehead as we answer the question. And I'm going to, just so you know what I'm doing while I answer the question, I'm going to, um, take my dark and I'm going to hook inside the ear too. So there, there's two parts to that, right? Cause that actually, it can be split into two different questions that are both, I think, valuable. Uh, let me first ask, not exactly what Doreen um, is asking, but let me first address the question how high, this is a different question distinctly, how high am I pulling up my loops, right? Because I thought that's where we were going first, and then I'm going to answer the actual question. How high do I pull up my loops? The basic rule is you pull it up about as high as the piece is wide. So if my piece is this wide, I'm going to want to pull up this much height-wise, right? About this high. Now, Doreen's asking a more specific question um, and incidentally, just so you know, I'm here in the ear Wait a minute. and I am going to, for this ear, just do, cause it seems like this ear is a little bit bigger, just a hair. I am going to come running down the side of this. Is my dark color, the pattern fraying as I go? It's fraying like crazy, but I'm just trying to control it. And this is another thing that you, you get a good handle on the more you do it. You control it. You stop it from misbehaving just like a, naughty child. Uh, and, and you, you, you kind of finesse that you, you get, you develop, um, you develop, um, your own sort of technique or, or handling of 
naughty materials that are trying to give you a hard time, you, you figure that out. That's another thing you will be able to lean into when you have more experience. How do I choose what cut I have? This is a number seven. How do I choose what cut I have when I, when I have a project? Well, it's always different, right? And always, it's, it's very situational for me because, for example, with this project, I know it's a beginner project, I feel like, in general, sometimes an eight is too um, wide, um, but only a little bit too wide. I like, I like it, sorry, making you seasick. I'm trying to get you in a little bit closer to me. Um, hang on, I'm just moving around a little bit. There. Um, eight is a great primitive, and you get the job done fast because it's so wide, it hooks up fast. But sometimes the eight, for those of you who have problems with twisting underneath, oh, my loops are twisting underneath. I saw what you did twisting your loop, but I'm not trying to twist my loop right now, and it's twisting underneath. That happens a lot more with the wider cuts. So I feel like when you give somebody an eight, nine, ten, those really large primitive cuts, the chance of having issues with twisting is much higher. So with beginner kits, I, I just think let's eliminate that. Um, a seven for me is kind of a happy, kind of a medium of a number because it's wide, but it's not, it's wide and it's fast, but it's not so wide that it's unwieldy. I feel like it's still a hair easier to twist number seven cuts than it is um, number eights or higher. So for a beginner kit like this, knowing I'm doing a primitive design, I want a larger cut. I just didn't want it to be an eight. When I'm doing other projects, uh, very different ones, like for example, the, the book I'm working on, the design like book. I'm gonna come, let me come to you for a while too as I, well, you know what, we'll stay here. We'll stay here because you might be working with me. Um, the design like book, I just made about 20 patterns for 20 different people. And um, Doreen, you said surprise me on yours. You're gonna be very surprised um, when you get the material. I'm dying it. It's not wacky wacky. But you're going to be surprised, and I hope that you're pleased. And, and please tell me if you're not pleased. But um, I think you'll think it's great and exciting. But anyway, with that series of projects, um, you know, I knew sending different projects out to different people. I, I, know, I know who I sent them to, right? I know my buddies who are doing the projects for me. And I, I took the time to look at other things that they had hooked in our group that I was aware of. And I just reminded myself, number one, for each person on each project, what do they like to hook? What subjects do they like to hook? What style do they like to hook? Are they primitive hookers? Are they beginners? And based on the kind of data that I, I was um, gathering, I made different decisions about cuts. So for example, uh, one person is doing a design like Grandma Moses. And by the way, I'm here in the corner again and Jay is about to help out by putting a light on the table. I think that's going to help us a lot. And it'll be shining right down on um, on Fox, on Little Fox. Um, somebody's doing a Grandma Moses, and as you can imagine, that is a very uh, busy composition. So, and I don't want it to be hideously large because I don't want to saddle people with massive time projects. So, it's probably 22 across kind of thing. It's a landscape orientation. And because it's busy, um, and I want it to look primitive, right, because it's, it's Grandma Moses, it's folky, and I am twisting underneath as I go because I'm following the line of the eyebrow again. Um, situations like the one I'm describing with uh, choosing a size are tricky. I ended up doing the Grandma Moses, I think, in a number five because I didn't want it to be too small, but I wanted it to hook up fast, and I knew there were tons of details. It might be able to sit right here. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, the light in here is like, I feel like I'm being x-rayed, and yet, here we go. Yeah. It's got me, I think it's getting my teeth more than it's getting. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I think that's a bit better. Now, um, I'm going to expand on that thought, too. I'm just going to come over here. I, I'm just choosing what I think is the most obvious place to, to go to next, right? Um and I do like, in this project for myself, I like the directional hooking that's happening like this, down into the snout. I like that line. I like that long line. I think it exaggerates the way that the little fox's little fur would be, um, would be looking, like on the snout. Right? It would be nice and um, 
shiny and, and a bit directional. So yeah, it is always tricky to figure out what cut to, to do. And if I'm looking for something that has a lot of shadow, like a lot of shading, like um, a year or two ago, I did a pattern called Mr. Tiffany's Bouquet. It was part stained glass, hence the Tiffany. And otherwise it was a beautiful spring uh, bouquet and it was very fussy. And it had the potential for some serious um, shading. So I did that in like number three or number four because I figured that that design would appeal to people who were very interested in shading. And that if that was the case, then they would not want a wide cut. They would want a very narrow cut. So it's always, uh, it's always a hard decision for me. But it's always something that stops me in my tracks and I'm required to be thoughtful and do a little bit of devil on the shoulder talking out loud to myself weighing the pros and cons of the wider cuts versus the narrower cuts versus yarn or, or non-traditional materials. It is going to be exciting. Oh, it really is, Doreen. The, um, I'm going to give you, a, I give you a hint by saying that because you have a Grenfell piece, um, it's very Grenfell-esque. So you can see I'm filling in as I go here. Whoa, I almost knocked the light down. Um, I'm just filling in. I got a little bit more to fill in at the head. And when I go in, I kind of do dental dental work here, looking for where that hole is. That's the next obvious. I could actually go over a little more. Place to start a new strand. And this time I'm going to come across here. Right across the forehead. Okay, so you're a little bit away from me here, so... I'm trying to lean in towards you, um, but I'm trying to see what I'm doing too. Let me see if there's any more questions there. How do you do the corner or point of an ear? Oh, I just did that a little bit earlier. I'll show it again with the tip of the tail because then we have another point there. Um, one of them I just, one of them, uh, if you look at the replay, I just hooked right up, but the other one I actually did like a little bit of a trick. So I'll do that again for a pointy, pointy tail time. And as I go, I'm kind of coming to the point where um, I'm meeting up with some of the other loops, like I'm meeting up with the, some of the other rows. So I'm coming to the point where I'm not really thinking as much about directional hooking. I'm kind of just blasting across, and I'm kind of doing space fill, like paint bucket time, right? If you do like paint, whatever the computer programs are, it's kind of paint bucket time. I'm just kind of filling in. And I come over as far as I can go. I'm just deciding where to put that last tail put him right here and pull him up and then I've got that little holiday on the head it's not a holiday because I haven't forgotten it yet and I'm not going to forget it but I got this little piece on the head that is yet to be done and I'm not this is kind of a willy-nilly if you are a very technical person you probably still want to go uh, very directional heavy hooking here but I am not a super technical hooker so I'm just I got a lot of good directional lines in that I'm real happy with and because this is hand dyed you see the colors change a little and there's some moments of darker color in there. I like that. I like that. I long for that. I want that. That's good for me. Um, I'm going to kind of speed up too, just a little bit. And I'm just going to fill in the rest here. And then I'm going to move to the body. Yep. And I'm just like doing the dental technique, right? Picking around for cavities, making sure that there's no holes. You don't want to do it to the extent that you are packing, which is such a temptation because it's very satisfying to get all your bits and pieces in there. Uh, try not to take it to an absolute extreme. I'm going to flip around and I'm going to blaze on the body. Now I have a thing here. I have a thing here where I have this line, right? So this line and this line are going to, It's remember how here I was lucky with the face? And the colors didn't touch each other. Well, they are going to touch each other here. So what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to look at my little pile of colors and I'm going to try to pick out the darkest one. And this is the darkest one. And being hand dyed, um, some should be slightly darker than others. And you know what I'm going to do with this darkest one is I'm going to set myself up right away with the tail. Uh, I'm going to make that the darkest one that I could find be the line for the tail. I'm going to hook right outside of it just so there is some definition between the tail and the body. 
I'm trying to hook a little bit closer to you so I'm hooking away from myself which is a little bit tricky but only for a moment I think this is going to help directional hooking is going to help establish lines where you need definition and demarcation but you don't want to outline directional hooking will help with that and doing what I just did by finding a shade that's a hair different darker lighter whatever that is also going to help make good decisions be confident and make good decisions about what you're doing now I'm right to the edge of his little body again and I am going to twist I'm twisting my hand underneath and I'm twisting my hand underneath so that the loop comes up in a different direction and you can see it came up real flush and nice right not all withered and wizened it came up nice and flush and nice and fat which is just what I wanted and now I'm coming over to the face and I don't really want to overshoot here I'm going to twist again like we did last summer and I'm turning directions again by twisting underneath this this twisting thing is not a technique that you absolutely need to use or perfect there are lots of ways right to I hate to say skin a cat there are lots of ways to get the job done um, without getting into twisting you might feel like twisting underneath is not for you if you noticed I just left my tail underneath because it was the perfect height of loop and I thought why not I'm going to remember that tail is there and I'm going to keep going around this little nose and I'm trying to be careful to not get onto the nose too much because I want that to be a nice I'm actually going to get a little bit closer to it because I don't want it to be like a Rudolph nose I don't want a Jimmy Durante right here just a just a dainty nose a dainty little signature nose so I pull up my loops a lot because I want it to be exactly right and I'm twisting underneath to turn this corner and all I'm doing by twisting is manipulating the fabric underneath so the loop comes up sideways and I want it to come up sideways because I'm trying to change direction on top now does my needle does my hook get stuck often like we were saying earlier in the backing yeah it does it does because this is not a great hook for this for this backing it, is it impossible no it's not impossible I'm, it's, I'm doing fine but it does happen and it happens more because this is not a great combo uh, this Hartman hook with the monk's cloth um, Janelle says I find I am pulling my loop up and the loop just before pulls out um, yes so that is a classic and you are not doing anything wrong um, you are absolutely not doing anything wrong that is just a classic and beginner thing and I even hate to say beginner because it might happen for a while and it happens to me sometimes too so when you do that this is what I would do and I see I also missed a comment so I'm going to come back there I'm just going to come over here and, and work and talk as I uh, talk through that one and let me get a little traction going because I got the tail let me get some loops going so when that happens what I'm doing Janelle is my hand underneath is wrapping around the crook to pull the loop up but keep holding on to it underneath keep holding the tail underneath pull down on the tail underneath while your hook pulls the hoop up this is a seesaw right this is like a seesaw your hand underneath is still grabbing at it and it's pulling down it's like a zombie coming out of the grave right like it's pull it's pulling you back down but my hook is pulling it back up and I lever between the two pulling down and pulling up until I get the perfect height my hook is not going to let go of the hoop on top my hand is not going to let go of the tail underneath and I lever until I get the perfect height and then move on if your hands are touching um, both if you're touching the loop that you're on right if you're holding that tail underneath you shouldn't be able to pull out the loop before I hope that makes sense of course nothing's impossible but it should help a lot if you hang on to that tail uh, for each you know forthcoming loop and place it well that will help uh, with leaving the the previous loop ensconced And that is how some people have a technique where they do this. They pull up and they pull over to the loop before and then they pull down to lock it in place. Right. That to me, 
I see people do it, pull up, pull over, and kind of lock in place, like using the friction against the piece before, the loop before, and also in doing so, you're getting the same height as the loop before, pulling up and pulling over and locking against that loop. A lot of people swear by that technique, and maybe maybe some of you out there are those people. Um, I've never found super merit in that technique, but that's exactly why different techniques are good for different people. I, I, I have different techniques that are my like golden go-tos, my greatest hits. And, and you will, whether, if you're, whether you're a beginner or not, you will evolve techniques that you love. Um, and you might hear my mouth running and say, well, I get what you're saying, but that doesn't work for me. So all of our bags of tricks, even though we all know the same stuff, will be different because over time, your brain will let go of some of the tricks that I'm telling you that don't work for you. They work for me. They don't work for you. Is it because there's something wrong with you? You're not doing it right? Nope. It's never that. It's just that that technique is not good for you, right? For whatever reason, and the reason doesn't matter. So you move on and you figure out a different technique. You figure out a different way to do it. And when you do that, over time, your brain just lets go just just like life, right? Exactly like life of all the other stuff that it was holding on to. And it has to be that way, right? It has to be that way. And then sometimes some time goes by and you're reminded of a technique that you used to do and you don't really do it anymore. Um, that's always fun to kind of revisit, right? Now, down here, I'm going to do, you know, I was going to do, yeah, I'll do the point of the tail here. I'm just going to continue. So I will do the point of the tail talk, I promise. I feel like I missed another. No, it, none of this is hard. Truly, none of it is hard. I'm literally pulling up loops. And all of the other stuff is, is like the window dressing, right? It's the pizzazz. I'm just pulling up loops. And over time, I have figured out the twisting thing and the pulling up and pulling down and levering thing. And the only reason I figured that stuff out was because my loops kept slipping too. So when my loops kept slipping, I tried to figure out, because I'm not certified, right? I was figuring it out as I went along. I figured, I tried to figure out why is this happening? How can I make it stop, right? And, and I'm telling you how I made it stop. You might find different ways um, of solving all kinds of problems, but um, these, are, these are the ways that I work, right? So some of it might be useful to you and you might wanna also kind of synthesize it if you've been taught by other people or you watch other videos and stuff. Um, that's great. You know, you're not cheating on me ever. You're learning and you're gathering and, and then you call all the information you've got and, and you choose the bits that are best for you. And when you are hitting a problem, you, you go to your mental bag of tricks and you figure out how to solve your problem based on the survey that you've taken and the information that you've gathered. You solve your problems based on that, right? So let me see. Um, um, Candace says, so... If you're doing a rug on the floor and you need to use fours for the detail and sevens for the background, would you still hook to the width of this strip? Yes, I still would. I would for a rug on the floor. That's a great question, Candace. I would for a rug on the floor because I know like rugs on the floor are absolutely jack trippers and I'm not a fan of um, a lot of variety for floor rugs, right? I, you think an even pile um, is safest, but I'm sure, I mean, people do put down the uh, Aubusson rugs that are like sculptured. They're like Walderboro rugs, right? And those are highly sculptured. I've had many a trip, like across the room. Like, um, what's that thing that people say when you trip? Um, uh, have a good trip, see you in the fall, that kind of thing, right? I've done many, many of those on the, sh on the shaped and sculptured carpets. And it's because of the uneven heights. Um, other people don't seem to mind. Much older people, I mean, my, I think my grandmother had a rug that was a bit um, sculpty. And, um, yes, yeah, obviously she was a much older person, and she didn't seem to trip on it the way that I tripped on it. But we're all different, right? We are all special <laughs> in different ways. But, yeah, I would, I would pull to the same height um, with a floor rug for sure. Now, you see, I'm coming around the tail here. This is the line I made for the tail right here. Just to emphasize that tail, I'm going to, you don't have to do it this way, but this is what I'm doing. I'm going to go right around it to emphasize it. So I'm doing my twisting and turning underneath, and you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. What's an, alter, what's an alternative to twisting your loop underneath? Well, just cutting it, right? Cutting it, leaving the tail on top, and 
um, starting in the next area so that you don't have to twist it, right? Just cut it. So I'm kind of going around the tail because I want to kind of make that darker line stand out. I'm packing a little bit here, just a little bit, but we'll see. And, I, and I'm not pulling all my tails up, as you're probably noticing, because, um, yeah, they're just, the loops are landing just right. And I think, well, the loops are landing right, and it's in there good and secure, uh, securely, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to fool with it. I like the last loop. I'm going to leave the last loop. Now I'm just filling in here. I know this is the part of the tail that blends in with that tip that we're going to do the trick to again. It's always good to see the trick. Now Janelle, are you having more luck now with keeping the loops up and not pulling the previous one out? I'm wondering, I'm hoping you are, and just remember it's a practice thing. You know, we all hope, this is another one of the things I say all the time, I'm like a broken record, we all hope that when we're learning something new, that we latch onto it sooner rather than later, but sometimes it's later. And when that's the case, you know, we don't want to put on a hair shirt and beat ourselves. We just say, hey, it's, it's frustrating, but it, I, I'm not getting it as quickly as I wanted to. Does that mean I'm not cut out for this craft? Of course it doesn't mean that. It just means you need to practice a little bit more with everything. You know, my kids do stuff all the time and are immediately triggered and frustrated because um, they, they don't get it right away. Everything, video games, crafts, everything. Um, if something's not coming easy, like a writing project from school, they're, you know, particularly Jocelyn, because she's younger, will, will be like, oh, I've been doing this forever. It's like, well, no, you've been, you've been doing it for three minutes. Um, you know, not to be irritating, but you, you've been doing it for three minutes. So um, if you could spare, for example, another five minutes, you might be an expert at that point. But um, you know, we all have different sort of kinds of fuses, right? And mine is not great. This is one area of my life hooking where I have a, a huge fuse. So I could sit and fool with the same loop, like indefinitely, but you cut me off in traffic and I'm going to lose my mind like instantly. Like, like I, I will be so unwell that, you know, I, I, I should have a straight jacket on and be driven to bedlam. Um, but we all have different fuses for different things, right? Now, I want to finish up over here, but I'm also feeling around for, yeah, I think I'll come up here with the loop. I got a little bit more to the tail to do. I hooked a little bit outside the line, which I normally don't do, and I think it's because I was holding this piece upside down. So I can see I'm running a little bit low on material, and I'm hoping that you are not having the same problem. In hooking outside the line, I used up some extra material, right? It was just a little bit, but that's all it takes to use up some extra material. I hooked quite a bit outside the line because I can see the line inside that last row, which is like really a lot. And I don't mind. He's going to be a chubby little fox. That's fine for me. Um, and I know I still have enough material, but that's one of the reasons I like to be real careful about uh, my hooking. I'm just over here feeling for, yeah, I can feel there's more holes in here. So before I move on and forget, right, because these are really hard to see, I'm just going to shore up in here. I can feel I was doing my little dental pick move in there. I could feel there was a few more holes, a little bit of gaposis. So I'm just shoring that up because this is how you turn into a packer, right? When you have this kind of mentality like I do where you're like, well, I feel there's a tiny gap in there. Let me get in there. That's just something that I do. And some of us do do that. It's just, it's kind of a mindset. Um, but that is how you get into packing. So you don't wanna, you wanna catch yourself if you feel like you're overdoing. Definitely filled that space in. So I'm coming around here and I'm finishing up the body of Little Fox. Oh, good, Janelle, I'm glad. I'm really glad. Different techniques, right? Different techniques. Um, it's just what our hands do. At the end of the day, it's pulling up loops. And you're going to pull up a lot of loops, right? Because you're going to love this. I, I know you're going to love this. You're going to pull up a lot of loops. And as you do, it's going to become clearer and clearer. Um, 
you're your your hands are going to do things that your brain isn't even telling them to do because because you're going to be problem solving and your your hands are going to twist and turn in ways that you think wow um that was like a a, a weird kind of possession i didn't know that i that i knew that or that i was it's your instincts kicking in as with everything right something's about to fall off a table and you lunge forward you lunge forward you're, you're bringing a plate of chicken pot pie or a spoon to your face and suddenly you see a plume of smoke rising off of it and you stop short. These are, this is all instinct, right? We do this with every part of our lives. Our, our crafting life is not going to be any different, right? It's not. I'm just coming in here now and I'm going to finish up this last little piece of his body. And I have to say, I'm not tuning my own horn. This material is a little bit tricky, but I do like it. It has a nice, um, has a nice texture to it. But also, I like the color change of it. And I am going to trim him down a little bit. He looks a bit, I don't even know if I am going to trim him down. He's got a few little threads hanging up. But I have to say, I kind of like it. I kind of like it. I mean, it's fur. You could also, and you could do this, um, you know, now if you're, if you're only watching and you're not hooking or later, you could, you could add novelty, like eyelash fur to his little body, right? You could do the dental pick thing and, and burrow in here and there and just pull up little tufts of like ginger colored eyelash, right? To make him truly furry. If you really wanted to pop him to pop in that way, wouldn't that be fun, right? You can do that afterward too. You can always add to your piece, just like with the Sharpie, getting in there and saying, yeah, I need, a, I need more. I need more of this or that. Going to add to the piece with the Sharpie. Do the same thing with material. If you look at little Fox when he's done and you think, yeah, he's good, but he doesn't look, I was hoping he'd look a bit wild, you know, and feral. Well, get some ginger eyelash fur and, and add that to his little body, and I bet he will. So that was pretty much it. I've got a few extra strands for the ginger that I didn't use, even though I hooked outside the lines. Give me just a minute to take a little sip. Janelle, I wish my hands were smarter than my brain, too. Um, that is, a, it's a thing. It's a thing, but it is a thing that will adjust. I promise. It really will. You know what I want to do next that's driving me crazy is his little nose, right? Because I see this little hole in here, and I don't want to forget about that. So I'm going to get in there, and I've got my dark, the dark black that really plays me. But, um, you know, with every project, I normally with kits just kit door wool, and it's like perfect milled wool every time. It's good with a project like this to have one or two materials that are a little bit tricky because you have to get used to tricky materials. You don't have to, but it'll be a lot more of an economical um, hobby if you get used to trickier materials because it means you can use anything. Your hands have to get used to them and you have to build that resolve to say, okay, you're playing me right now, but it's only for this short section, right? And then, and then you're in there and yeah, Played, played me a little bit, but immediately, that nose looks great, right? I just filled it in a little bit, a um, little bit of a crescent shape, kind of feeling my way as I went. Yeah, this ear has the one little mark. This one has the V, little noses in there. So far, so good. I'm liking it. Now, I think next I'm going to do, I'm going to do the, the whites. So I'm going to take out that little bit of um, the kind of creamy color I've got, I'm going to shake it out because the blacks touched it and the blacks make all kinds of lint, right? Because it's the Tweety. Um, gosh, I hope I put enough of this in here. Now I'm looking at it and thinking, that's not that much. Let's see how it goes. We could always add some of the, this guy because there's lots of weight in this one too. Let's see how it goes. So first let me do the tip of the tail, the way that we were talking about before. Let's do the tip of the tail the way we did before. I'm going to do the sharp tip, right? So I'm going to take my piece in my hand like this. It's a small tip of tail, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fold it in half like this. I'm just gonna fold it over like that, maybe an inch or two, because I know that there's not a lot to hook right here. Like this. And I'm gonna come underneath with it over my hand like that. Right, so there's two tails. And I'm gonna start in the tip. And I'm going to pull up one loop. Now underneath, I want to show you this again, underneath I have two tails, right? 
That's a character from Sonic. That, I, that, that was not lost on me. My son lets me know all about the video game characters. Two tails, right? So I'm going to take one of the tails. Doesn't have to. Do, I'm, I just grabbed the shorter. You grab whichever. Oh, hi, Suze. Oh, that's great. You're hooking a turkey. That sounds great. Super. Do absolutely anything. We're just spending time together, right? Now, I got this one loop in, and I'm holding that tail, and I'm grabbing that tail, and I'm hooking down the side of the tip of the tail with that one little short tail. That's what I'm. That's where my hands are. And I'm almost at the end of that little, yep, that was the end. Now I'm taking the other. Now it's not two tails anymore because I just hooked one. I've got the other one, and he's pointed to the other side of the tail. Right? I did, it's like a V. So I'm going to leave that loop on top. I'm not going to go near that loop because having that single loop is why I'm going through the this process, right? Why, why, I'm, why I'm hooking with this technique is because I want that one loop at the tip to really stand out as a nice little sharp loop. And then I just come shooting down the side. And I'm figuring out as I go because it's a jagged line right here where the, where the tip of the tail meets um, the white part. And I don't want to displace my orange. So you know what I think I'm going to do is put a loop. Just deciding as I go. I'm feeling it out as I go. And I'm doing the dental pick thing and trying to figure out where the gaps are because I know that the tail goes down. Yep, I see I'm finding where it kind of dips down in here. And I'm going to follow that to its eventuality. Yeah, I think that's probably it. I think that's probably it. So let me try to force up one more. Yeah, there's no more spaces in there, and I don't want to pack. So I'll force up one more loop, and I'll trim them. And then I'll finish filling in this little part here. I know white on white is hard for you to see right now, but we're going to finish the white, and then we'll move on to other colors that are a little bit easier. Pulling up here. Yep, this all looks this all looks good. And you know, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking as I go. Um, I'm figuring it out as I go. The tip of my tail is not going to look exactly the same as the tip of yours. Um, and that's a big who cares, right? That's a big in a hundred years. It ain't going to make any different difference. But if you like the way the tip of your tail looks, look at how nice that little loop on the top looks. Just the one loop, right? Didn't that work out well? You can see the nice sharp shape here. You'll see it more when I fill in the background. So I'm going to take another one of my light pieces and. Let me hook around the face. I'm gonna, I'm just deciding. I think I'm gonna start this way. And I'm gonna hook up around the eyes and I'm gonna give them nice big eyes, kind of little anime eyes. That's, I know that's what Jocelyn intended. Um, having the big, the big eyes, like the who me kind of eyes. Shooting up the corner here. Suze, I'll be, um, I'll be excited to see your turkey. I love turkeys. I saw it in the field when I was driving home the other day. I might have told you this on coffee time. I can never remember what I said, right? I, usually I can, but um, not always. I, I saw so many turkeys out in the field, and they were all like Tom the turkeys. You know, they were all boys. Oh, I hope I have enough of this thinking if I gave you white, I might not have given you enough. And if that's the case, I'm going to switch to my, um, I'm such a ding dong. Then I'm going to switch to some of the light parts of this. We'll see how it goes. I don't actually mind if there's a little bit of color in there too. I think that'd be kind of cute. Let's see how it goes. I normally don't do that. I'm normally really, really good at anticipating, but I might have screwed this one up. And if I did, I'm super sorry. We'll make it work with the whites with the whites in the tie dye. I might have given you a little bit more than I gave myself too because I I just grabbed like the smallest pack for myself because I figured I can make pretty much anything work. So now I'm coming up the other side of the eye and make that crescent shape. And again I know I said this before but if I'm working faster than you 
that's not a thing, right? We, we all, we're all different. We all do different work. Um, some people are incredibly fast hookers, and I'm, I'm not incredibly fast. Um, I kind of envy that, but hey, I hook the way that Deanna hooks. You hook the way that you hook. We'll all be happy, right, if we're not comparing each other to each other. You compare yourself to yourself. And otherwise, you're setting yourself up for some major uh, disaster, emotional disaster, if you compare yourself to anyone else with anything else. I think because I'm running low, I'm actually going to pull this up, trim it, and do one more loop with it. Let's see. And because I'm running low, I'm going to start over here. Because it might be that because I have to switch to the other color to get some of those whites, it might be that I want at least this part the same, right? Because I'm not going to get up and get more white. I could, but I'm not. Because this, is, this craft is a thrift craft, and it's about problem solving. I'm going to solve my problem if I run out of white. I'm going to solve my problem while remaining seated. Right? That's what I'm going to do. It's very nice when you get to this point, very satisfying to be running these curves and stuff alongside a row of hooking that is already in place. You know, very lush, very tactile when you've got the loops kind of um, butting up against each other in their permanent position. It's, it's fun. It's fun when you hit your groove in this part. Now I can see I'm coming around this side, and I want to be careful about this shape. I'm going to kind of crowd the reds, because it's supposed to have a sharp little edge to it. Um, but I don't want his face to be deformed, so I want to make sure that I'm far enough over with the whites here. Right? And I'm really... I keep pulling in and pulling up the same loop because I really want to be careful here. Anything that has to do with the shape of the face, right? Because his face will look weird if the shape is wrong, right? Though if there's one thing I want to be right, it's going to be the shape of the face. That was the last of my whites. So I am not, I'm not standing up. I'm going to come over here and look at my light packet. Oh, here's a good long stretch. Here's a good long stretch. Oh, here's a good long stretch, too. Interesting. Now I've got some choices. Um, well, they're all quite good, actually. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick a random one, figure out what end is lighter. This end's quite light. I'm going to go for that. So because I ran out of the white, I'm just going to go for a different color that's still quite light. It's got a lot of the rainbow in it. Now this one's even better. Let's go for this one. I'm going to cut off this blue part because that really stands out as being darker. Just going to cut it right under, but I'm going to use the blue. Believe me, there's no way I'm giving up this cute piece of blue over here. I, I like it too much. But I'm going to go in with the white, and let's see if it makes much of a difference. Um, so moments like that right, could be characterized as huge snafus, uh, minor heartbreaks. But you can't, you, with this craft, you just can't treat, you can't treat them like that, right? We are filling in the, the face of a fox, okay? So perspective and all that. And um, I try, in my, in my regular life, I, I, I'm a huge overreactor, and I come from a long line of overreactors. But um, with this craft, this is just part of the zen, the yoga, the being um, calm. I try not to get too wound up over nothing with this craft. Because if I apply that kind of traffic jam mentality to my hooking, it's not fun for me. And I can see there's some kind of little um, colorful loops coming up here. And you know what? kind of like them. I really kind of like them. Adds a lot of color to him. He looks like a little bit of a rainbow. Just around the eye, it's not super um, obvious. I like it. I quite like it. This is, for me, what I would call a happy accident. If you're very technical and you ran out of white and you want me to send some more, just let me know. I'll send some more. Um, I'm not super technical, as I've said, so things like this don't bother me that much. There is some shading around the eye, but I bet you anything when I get that um, dark pupil in, it's not really going to matter at all. So let me grab another one. I'm going to come down here now. I'll finish that eye in a minute. And this is kind of a good lesson because um, the reason I ran out is because I'm doing a lot of hooking outside the lines. 
And, um, and that sounds like a good thing, but it's not when you're working with a kit. It's not such a good thing, is it? Because you can run out of your materials like I did. Um, that's also just me being a bit of a boob. All right, so let me cut this here. I'm just working around the pupils. It's going to be very good when I get the pupils in. And that just, that sort of um, rejigging of color just gave me an idea about color placement too that I'll share with you in a couple of minutes when we get there. We're doing pretty good, I have to say. I mean, we, st we had a very slow start and my mouth is running like crazy, but this is the hard part. So we're kind of doing the hard part now and you'll be amazed at how quickly the rest of it comes together. I think it's a really good idea with these small pieces to find a picture frame for them to go in. Because um, unless you need a little rug mug or something like that, it is a very small piece. But I feel that even small pieces should be celebrated in the same way. And um, I'm just choosing directions here. There are some loops coming up that are quite colorful. I'll make, it, I'll make another judgment call later on this. Because that was pr pretty bright green that just came up. I have a feeling I'm still going to like it, though, because I do like more color. Um, let's look for another one that's on the lighter side. This one's good. Oh, gosh, I forgot what I was just saying. Huh. He is very cute. Karis is finally getting it. Boy, this phrase, but he looks... Yeah, the red one does fray more than the other ones you're about to use. So try to stick with it. See how it goes. It, for me, it frayed a little bit, but when you're just starting, it has potential to fray more because um, you might be fooling with the, the loops a little bit more. And it, it is going to look beautiful. And m trust yourself that in the future, more and more with materials that are a little more difficult, um, you will be able to handle them like better. So, for example, and, and I think that you're handling it beautifully. I didn't mean better. I just was at a loss for a word. Um, mine only mine only frayed a little bit, but that's because I'm used to doing doing war with difficult materials. And my point is, uh, you will also become used to doing war with difficult materials. And that is part of the beauty of this craft is figuring out and building up that confidence uh, dealing with the difficult materials. But you'll find less and less. You'll fray less and less. <laughs> Didn't sound right, but you know what I mean. So I'm looking at the shape of his eye, and I'm trying to figure out how far I want to go in there, right? Placeholders. I think this is the last one I want to do. I don't want to do so much that the eye, the pupils are uneven, right? I don't want to do that to myself. So let me get another piece of black. It's actually still the same piece of black. And I'm going to come in, and I'm going to try to do the eyes. And I'm going to start at the bottom and come up. I'm, I'm going to want to trim that down. And I'm immediately going off to the side. I want a good little olive-shaped eye here. Oh, that just reminded me. I have such a funny story about olives. I'll tell you in a minute. Let me just get through this one. And I'm making decisions about shape as I go. Because I want it to be long, long and skinny eyes. Um, but I don't want them to be like a slit up and down. If you want yours to be like an up and down slit, you know, uh, if you can picture cartoon characters like that, then you should. But I want mine to remain kind of roundish, partly because when Jocelyn sees this, if it's not exactly like the original drawing, uh, it's going to be like um, hell raining down on my head. So she likes it when things are exactly like her drawing. She's a bit of a purist. So I like that. And we get another piece. I have just a little bit more dental pick work here, right? Just a little bit more off on the side. And that's going to complete the eye. And then I move to the other eye. So. The funny story that I thought of about the olives, oh my gosh, it's such a funny story. It was It's a tour guide story that goes back 20 years. I had this guy on the tour bus once. Now listen, I'm going to pause and say, I pulled up a great loop. The eye is exactly the shape I want it right now. And if I, if I cut the loop um, to leave the tail on top, it might not look exactly the same. So I'm not going to. I'm going to cut. Do you hear this? Me breaking the rules like crazy. I'm going to cut the loop. Well, you know, I'm looking at it at the monitor. I changed my mind. I was going to cut the loop under. I think I'm going to bring one more up here. Because when I look at your view, it seems like he could have one more. Yeah. That's it. 
that's it. I'm still going to cut that loop underneath, right? So my scissors is going underneath to cut the half off that, to cut the tail off that loop because I like the eye just like that. That's another situation in which uh, I don't leave my tails on top all the time. When I find a shape that I like exactly like that, I don't fool with it. I just cut, cut underneath and run so that I don't run the risk of changing the shape of even half of a loop. So back in the day when I was a tour guide, I had this guy, a single guy, take the tour. And he was, uh, now that I have an autistic son, I realized that this guy was autistic. He was a young guy, and he traveled alone a lot. He, would, he, was, um, he was different enough that he probably had trouble making friends his age. So he was on this group tour with me, and it was a, it was a pleasure having him because he was a lot of fun. Very literal person, very literal, very dry, right? Not a huge sense of humor. And he told me this story about the last tour that he had been on and it was somewhere like tropical and I think it was Mexico and the bus pulled up and it dropped everybody off at this beach where there was like a little tika with a little bar um, you could have some cocktails you could go swimming whatever and they said you know meet back at this many hours now hang on a second with that story because this is an excellent story I finished my two eyes very happy with those and I'm going to put away the black because I don't think I'm going to use that anymore I'm thinking about the rest of my um, colors. Oh, I've got yarn too. Oh, I've got yarn too. Let's do the yarn um, later because I'm going to punch. You can hook, but I'm going to punch as well. I'm going to, you know how I filled in a little bit of this with the rainbow? That makes me want to immediately resolve in my head, where am I putting the rest of the rainbow? Right, like that's, that's a thing for me now because I don't want it to be too close to the eyes Although, it probably would look really pretty. Because my choices right now, I have this, the, the more pumpkin orange. I have the rainbow that I started using on the eyes. And I've got these two colors. So, I think what I meant for this pattern was to put, was to use this in the border, this really colorful one. I think I'm going to put... I think I'm going to use the purple for the sky behind him. Um, so I think I'm going to use this orange for one of these blobbies and the colorful pastel for the other blobby. So I think for this moment, my plan is to put the colorful pa pastel over on the side here. I think that's my plan. So I'm going to do that. So what I'm going to do first, I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute. What I'm going to do first... I'm going to get this little piece that I didn't use up, right, the blue, because I'm such a magpie. I'm going to go shooting straight up the edge, and I am going to hook inside the lines, right? I'm not going to fool around with that anymore. I'm right here. I'm right at the edge of the line. Remember, I added this part with the, with the year, so forget about that. That was just to demonstrate. I'm going to hook straight up the line here, and I'm going to run out immediately because I could not part with, I'm going to leave that loop like that because that's perfect. And I'm just going to run straight up the line and then do kind of concentric shaping out. So this bus pulls up, and this guy, I forget what his name is, uh, gets out and he's by himself. So he decides what he wants to do is take a walk on this uh, beach in Mexico. And he walks very far. This reminds me of the Dorothy Sayers book called um, Have His Carcass, if you know, if you know your mysteries. Um, so he's walking really far because he knows he's got a few hours on this beach getting some exercise getting away from the beaten path and he is on this beach and he said there was nobody in sight in either direction and there was a body a dead body on a rock recently deceased now hang on here because I came to the top of my cloud so I'm going to pull up the tail I'm going to want to trim that later well, I'll trim it now that just worked out well because it's, kind of, it's another kind of acute angle up here, and I didn't even have to address it because my strip ended right there. So this guy sees this dead body on the rock and panics because he's looking up and down the beach, and all he sees are other rocks, but nobody in sight, and it's fresh blood. And he's thinking, somebody just slit this guy's throat on the beach, and he can't have gotten too far because I can see in every direction. And he's, he's thinking, this, whoever did this is, is like hiding right behind one of the other rocks. I'm in big trouble. 
So he starts running, and he is a runner. I forgot to say that part of the story. He is a runner. Oh, I love Lord Peter too, Janelle. Right? It is. It's one of the. It's one of the. Um, what was your name? Harriet Vane and Lord Peter mysteries. Um, as you know, as you know, that was a good reference. Um, so yeah, so um, he starts running up the beach, and he's a, he's like a great athletic, crazy athlete, kind of a runner, and he makes it. it he says he's huffing and puffing. And he makes it back to the main beach where, like, the rest of the tour have not left. And he runs up to the little tika hut where they're doing cocktails and stuff. And he's not the kind of person to clear a space, right, because he's, he's quite autistic and very, very soft-spoken. But he rushes right up to the front of the line. And, and he, he's trying to get the bartender's attention, and the bartender doesn't, doesn't want to acknowledge him because he cut so he, he's really getting agitated and nervous, and he's <laughs> very upset. And so he said he slammed his hands down on the edge of the bar, and he said, um, he said to the bartender, um, there's a dead man on the beach. And the bartender said, what? And he said, there's a dead man on the beach. And the bartender said, what? And he said, there's a dead man on the beach. And the bartender said, what's in that? It's not a joke. I'm not kidding. And this guy who told me this story had absolutely no sense of humor, and he did not think it was funny. And he was actually surprised when I started laughing really hard because it's such a great punchline. And he never got it. He never got that that was such, I mean, it's not a funny story, is it? But he, he never got that it was a bit of a funny story because he never really got that that punchline was um, incredible. But he, he, um, he was so upset and worked up about it. He actually got arrested and had to stay in Mexico for quite a while while they investigated the crime because he reported it, but he was the only person who was found near the scene of the crime, and he did not have the benefit of, like, uh, the protection of the tour company or anything like that. So, you know, it was not, it was not, um, it was not a great thing for him, needless to say. But he, he next took a tour with me, and my tours were very, I think, it, I think we were in New England that time. Um, so, yeah, obviously nothing like that was going to happen in New England. But I think he maybe had his fill of the kind of adventure tours. And he thought, let me take a tour with um, like some slightly older people in a place where there will probably not be a dead body. But yeah, I thought that was, that was just one of the funniest, um, funniest things I've ever heard. And one of the horrible things, and don't listen if this, oh, good morning, Gail, good to see you. One of the funniest things about it for me, thinking about it, was um, the fact that um, he said, and this is awful, that the guy's eyes were like black, like his eyeballs were black. And I still, I'm not a medical person, and I still don't understand why. I never researched it. But it's funny because on one of our cocktail nights, um, not long after, when I was living in Amsterdam and we had a cocktail night every Friday, um, one of the themes that I made up for our cocktail nights was like um, storytelling, like telling your own story or telling someone else's story. And I thought, let me tell a story let me tell his story because it's such a great story about this dead guy on the rock on the beach, right? And I was trying to think of what my cocktail would look like. And I ended up making um, something with like, um, I want to say Cuerzo or like one of the Mexican uh, tequilas, right, for like the hat tip to the Mexico part of the story. And I put like some tropical fruits and things in it like I imagined would be at the tikka bar. But I also put in it two, two black olives, like for the eyeballs. <laughs> that was maybe in poor taste, but... Gosh, that was fun. So you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just um, going around and filling in the center. And I, I quite, I have to admit, I quite like the way that this looks with this very pastel cloud and a little bit of the color picked up in the eyes. I quite like it. I do. I'm not just saying that. I quite, I, I do. I love a rainbow. Really love a rainbow. Oh, um, I missed something. You were talking about framing. Yes, Lucinda, I'll talk about that again. Kara said, finally getting it. Boy, that phrase. Yep, and then Sharon said, he's looking like a baby fox. He's very cute. He is very cute. And Sue says, the thought that helped me keep my perfectionist self at bay was imagining a woman from the 1850s wanting a warm rug for her cold floors hooking with a bent nail by firelight. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's the whole story, isn't it? Um, and, and when you think of that, that really puts it in perspective and you think, yeah, 
I've, I've got a tool, you know, I, I've got like contemporary materials are never going to be as difficult and challenging as those materials. Um, yeah, and using these materials that fray a little bit more, this colorful one is not. This is a door mill material that I dyed. But challenging yourself with using ones that fray a little bit, it's well worth it. It honestly is well worth it because then you can make all kinds of heirloom stuff with things, you know, people in your family who've, who've passed away or whatever, things from savers, thrifty things. You'll be able to use all that stuff when you have built up a kind of confidence level, um, resistance to being triggered by the more difficult materials. It's something to build up a little bit. Um, because we're kind of spoiled for choice with everything these days. And yeah, you can buy just just the milled wool, right? You never want to use, well, I try not to use like braided, the braiding wool and stuff because it's much thinner. And um, I feel it doesn't have as much body and integrity as, it, as you pull it up. But um, yeah, I like to use different materials and I do like a lot of crazy wools that play me a ton and are very difficult to use, but nothing else hooks like them sometimes. And so I forced myself over time to get in the habit of just dealing, dealing with it. And for that reason, now when I'm in an antique store or something and I see a material that I know is going to be super, 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 super loose and tricky and frustrating, I get it anyway because I think I really like it. And I, and I, I like the colors and I'm afraid I'm not going to see something like that again. And I'm going to get it and I'm going to deal with it, right? And, and it's always up to you how much you can take, right? Because because if you're if you are with hooking the way I am in traffic, you don't want any extra challenges, right? You don't want you're like give me the door milled wool, don't don't give me anything else, and and with um, like kits and things like you know not stuff like this that we're just kind of fooling around on an afternoon, but with like proper kits and stuff that cost like quite a bit, you know, material wise, I always just do the door mill uh, wool stuff, and occasionally I'll give you something tweety, but you know if I'm giving it to you. And and some are better than others, you know. Let me catch up with the recipe for cocktail. Oh, oh, Arian is on. He's remembering the recipe for that cocktail. That is the actual recipe from that night that we did the cocktails. Two ounces of rum, vermouth, add two black olives. That's funny. Sharon likes that. I have a macabre sense of humor also. And Sue says, I'm never going to look at black olives without thinking of this story. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I just had some black olives at lunch, too. I love them. I love them. Black olives, sometimes in our house, called fingernails, right? Just like bugle chips. Love putting them on the on the fingers. So I pulled up the last loop for this cloud here. I'm really, I'm loving the way this looks. Sometimes I look at my loops and I think um, some are higher than others, you know. Um, it, that doesn't bother me, but if that bothers you, just get your hook in there and pull some of them up a little bit later. Something you can do at the very end of the project too, if you're looking at it and there's one or two loops that are that are um, really galling you, you know, just just deal with them now or later, whatever whatever is better for you. So, all right, so I think I'm going to put this. Let, let's get this filled in in this top corner here. So I've got my lighter orange, and I'm going to fill in this piece here. And let me move you a little bit so you can see. Right here, let me tilt you up because you can see the edge of my computer there and make sure the light. I'm experimenting with the different kinds of light. That's too blue. Yeah, maybe that's all right. We'll stick with that for now. So I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to want to run up the side first. So I'm going to pop in at the bottom and I'm going to run straight up the side. This is when it, oh, I forgot to talk about framing. I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, hold on one second. I just want to say when at the beginning, when I labored the point about transferring your part, your, your, your pattern on in a perfectly squared manner, this is what I'm thinking of. When you get to the edges, you really should, it should be really obvious where your straight line is. And it's only obvious if you are squared. If you are not squared, you are trying to accidentally sidle over into the next row, and you are going to be able to tell. You're definitely going to be able to tell. And that's going to be hard. So try not to do that to yourself. Try to make sure that if you are transferring your own patterns, that you're doing it um, very, very, very square. You want all these good, clean lines. 
and it is so nice to do a good solid run, you know. Gosh, I hope I'm not going to run out of this one. I'm wondering what I was doing when I was working on this pattern because it seems like I'm close on everything. So framing wise, um, with this piece, right, because I have tons of videos on actually finishing edges and things, and that is a very time consuming, that's a whole other thing, right? So I would, I could spend um, a live video with you just finishing something off because um, that would be its own conversation, but like whip stitching or, or sewing under or something like that. But for a small piece like this, I would be very, very um, into, and I think I will with this piece, just putting it in a frame, like from the craft store, from an antique store, maybe a frame I already have, something on the mantle, just finding a frame that it'll fit in. And maybe I can hook the edges out a little bit, like I showed at the beginning, to fit the frame completely. Um, just so you don't have, see any background material between the edges of your piece and the frame. And you can do that with hooking. You can also do that with quilt fabric. And I've done that many times, just taking some strips of quilt fabric, like pieces from a jelly roll or whatever, and just literally sewn on either with a sewing machine or a needle and thread, sewn on a little bit of um, quilting material, like a pretty print that really complements the colors or the design or the feel of what I'm doing um, with the piece. So I always find that to be really a fun option too. I've done that quite a bit. And, um, and that just gets you, all that's doing is, is bringing you to the edge of your piece, to the, where, where the frame is gonna meet, uh, so that that's a nice crisp line. As I come up here, I see I'm right next to the ear. And coming straight up and again your pattern doesn't have to follow my lines exactly like not at all not at all if you if you're like oh, I'd like it if the air stood out more then then do do it further away do your line further away you don't have to do exactly what I did just because Jocelyn drew it this way right I'm taking a sippy sippy break oh it is nice to sit and hook. I'm telling you, we, sh we have to do this more often. Um, I, I am going to do one of these every month because um, I really, I enjoy this. And because I've been doing so much book stuff lately, I have not been sitting and hooking at all. And, you know, it's just, it's just what's happening at this moment. But um, I miss it. I really miss it. This for me is, is like, you know, church just sitting here and doing this repetitive stuff. And we're talking today, we're ta I'm, I'm, I'm talking, but I'm looking at your comments too and try to respond and um, interact. But if I'm watching TV, you know, Mary Tyler Moore Marathon or whatever, it's perfect, perfect craft to be doing. Sometimes I just sit in the quiet and I think my thoughts, you know, think, think out a bunch of thoughts that otherwise I'd think about at 3.15 in the morning. And um, what a great hobby for working out all those big thoughts, right? So I'm coming up here now and I like a nice straight line across the corners and I know that I'm squared out because you saw me draw it. So I'm just coming shooting across here now. It's great to listen to audiobooks. I'm sure you already thought of this. Um, I love listening to audiobooks while I work on hooking. And then don't you always, when you do that, don't you always, I'm going to sneak in here now because I, I, I don't have to cut the tail if I can find close by enough space. Yep, I'm just going to continue on. Ramble on. Um, don't you find that if you're working on a quiet project like a hooking project or a sewing project and you're listening to a book cassette or an audible book or whatever, um, that you will always associate that project with that book. And, I, and especially if you love the book, I think that is, it's just such a huge plus. I can remember like listening to some of my favorite books and I remember exactly what I was working on. And I just love that because they are like forever entwined. Now, if it turned out you didn't like the book that much, then maybe that doesn't work well. I'm working upside down. I'm having trouble seeing. That's why I keep pulling pieces out. I think I'm gonna flip for a minute just so that I can see better. And I can keep up my speed. And I like I like um, this material too because there's a lot of um, color change in here. 
Let me do that one last because that was a kind of edgy piece. And I just want to remind you if you are having any kind of issue with um, pulling up the loops and you feel like it's just too hard or your wrist starts to hurt or something like that, you can just take a pair of scissors and cut your loops in half. Right? You end up with much thicker loops. You don't have to work in number sevens because I'm working in a number seven because I gave you a number seven. Right? You can hook in whatever you want. Sharon, you li listen to history podcasts. Oh, that is interesting. Let me know if you are listening to any that you think are particularly good. I like listening to podcasts, too. Um, oh, Jamie, okay. It has been terrific. It is getting faster. You're finding less travel. Um, yep, until next time, I will see you soon. I'm going to stay here. But, Jamie, I'll see you next time. I'm glad it's going well. Yeah, I've been listening to a podcast called The Antique Shop. It's the girl is Scottish that's doing it. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's a bit magical. It's a bit, uh, I didn't know what it was about, but it, I liked the name. And as soon as I started listening to it, I binge listened to like 15 of them. And the premise is that there's this antique shop on this little side street. I, it might be London, but it might be Edinburgh. It's hard to say because the narrator is Scottish. But wherever it is, there's this little antique store and the girl um, is looking for a job. It's the main character, the narrator. She's looking for a job, and she hasn't had any luck finding a job. And she's walking up a street where she's walked a hundred other times, and she sees this antique store that she's never noticed before. And there's a sign in the window that says, Help Wanted. So she goes inside, and there's a woman inside, um, nice woman, um, very um, small, cramped, antique store, lots of interesting looking things around. And the woman hires her on the spot without knowing much about her. And so she's very grateful for the job. And and she says, when should I start? And the woman says, immediately. So I'm not going to tell any of it in case you listen, but basically, and this is the this is the premise. It's not it, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but it's not a huge spoiler because you're going to get it in the first episode, what the sort of overarching th theme of it is. What's happening is that the only people who can see the shop are people who have this special sort of magical ability. Um, no, not yet. I'll talk about that in a minute, Aryan. Um, and, the, and the girl is one of them. So because she has this magical ability, um, that's why she was able to see the shop in the first place. And that's why the woman who hired her knew that she would be a good person to work in the shop because people who don't have this power wouldn't have seen the shop because it's not there for them. It's like Brigadoon. So in every episode, people come into the shop and they need a certain thing. It's different for each episode to help them with a problem in their life. And it's very interesting the things that they need to buy for the problems they need to solve. Because, of course, the thing that they have in common is that they all have this magical ability. And it is very interesting uh, and other characters get introduced, like it, you've, as it evolves, there are a whole society of people who are, um, you know, shoulder to shoulder with everybody else who have this sort of magical uh, side to them. And there are, there's a kind of an, a, a hierarchy and there are good guys and there are bad guys. And it is super interesting. Reminds me of that episode of the Twilight Zone. Do you remember the one way back when? where the guy, there was a guy stand, oh, it gives me the shivers thinking about it, a guy standing on the edge of the road on the corner with this kind of traveling salesman suitcase, and he would say to people as they pass by, um, I have what you need, not what you want, but what you need. And, and he would sell people different things or give them different things based on what he knew they needed. And this, is, this was like also magical in the same way, right? So um, sometimes it was for the good. And if you remember this episode, sometimes it was not for the good. So that was one of those really creepy Twilight Zone episodes from way back when. And no, I have not told you about the Design Light class. Well, I think I told you about it on um, Coffee Time the other day. So I just put the, I just put the picture for it together and, and named the dates. And it is now active and online. Uh, this month is going to be a really great one design like uh, the Vintage Vogue covers. So for everyone who's been asking for the theatrical designer and fashion designer, um, Erte, Erte, along with all of his contemporaries, all of those 19 
20s, 1930s, very stylized, very fashion-driven, very theatrical, graphic designers, they will all be included in this, um, this episode. And we'll be looking at not just Vogue covers, but uh, covers from other sort of ladies' fashion magazines at the time, because all of the art, that was the greatest moment in covers, right? Like, hands down. It really was. The 20s, 30s. Those covers are so beautiful and whimsical and imaginative, and they're very flat and graphic. So they lend each other so, they lend themselves so well to this craft because they're super flat and graphic. So it's going to be one of the classes where I send you a file um, a couple days before because, of course, I need time to do it. I'm not ready to do it right now. And uh, it's stuff to print out if you, wanna, if you want to during class so that you... Um, I know not everybody draws, for example, figures well or buildings well or whatever. So I give you parts that I have drawn already that you are welcome to use my drawings, absolutely welcome. Uh, and you can use my drawings to create compositions that might be out of your comfort zone or not. Or you can wing it as you go and just do your own drawing. But it will be one of the classes where I give you some materials. If you feel like I'm not a great drawer, I'm not going to come up with some really good stuff. Um, that's why I'm giving you a file first, so that if you if you don't feel like you're good at freehand drawing, then you're still going to have a lot of success in this class. So that is coming up soon. Oh, Sharon says, Betwi Betwixt the Sheets, Emperors of Rome, oh, Amarna Heresy, um, Gone Medieval, History is Sexy, Talking Tutors. Oh, you have a bunch of them that, oh, you have a bunch of them that you listen to. I'm never going to remember that. How am I going to remember that? I might have to take a screenshot of that. Um, I like that. You like the British history, right? I like. I mean, I like that stuff too. I love the Tudor history. I love the War of the Roses. I love that. I mean, it's a horrible, violent period. I love. I love that moment in history too. I don't. You know, I didn't watch like the Tudors. I don't watch the Game of Crowns or any of that because I know I can't handle that kind of violence. Um, but I still am very interested in that period of history. The Elizabethan period, too, and Shakespeare and all of that. I love, love that stuff. Love that stuff. Yeah, so I have several extra strips. So this is no problem getting through this part. That was that was well measured um, on my part, if I do say so myself. So I'm coming to the end of this little guy, and I'm just finding places to put the last little tails, working them in there. Look at that nice color change. Isn't that nice? Oh, I like a good bit of color change. So now let's see. We have these two bits in. We are, um, okay, so we have our background. What else do we have? What else do we have? For our background, we have the lilac. For, I'm looking at what I have a lot of. Oh, I think I meant to put the black somewhere else too. Well, we could still do that, I suppose. I'm looking at my colors that are left. I feel like I'm missing a color. I feel like I'm missing a color from the packs that I gave you all. I might be. I might be. I think I am missing a color. So I'm not going to agonize. I'm going to make it work. But let's see how it goes first. Let's see how it goes. So what I'm going to do next, um, let's do, still thinking. You know, I think I did mean to do the black border. I'm debating if I should, because that, that's a real play you material, the border. Um, you know what? Let me outline parts of it. Let me outline parts of it first. So I'm taking my black out again, and I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just establish the border, so that I that, see. I can tell it's gonna play me because it's wanting to shred up. I didn't realize it was quite that bad, or I wouldn't have given it to you. So please don't hate me. And you can see the way that it's coming off. If it's fraying, it's coming off in a certain direction. So work with it in that direction, if you see what I mean, so that it frays less. Yeah, this one is going to be a player. Let's see how it goes. It's a, it's a loose weave, that's why. All right, so I'm going to, I just want to establish the frame. So I'm going to come down here like this, because I want to punch the inside with you. I'm going to switch to punching, just in case anyone is more interested in punching. I'm going to come shooting down the side, but I don't want to overshoot um, the border. So that's why I at least want to get the line for the border in. So I'm coming straight down. You know, the, the fabrics that play you the most, they work better 
when you are doing straight lines. Right? If you do twisty turnies and stuff, um, they work less well. But just doing straight lines should be should be fine. And you know, once in a while, you're going to get a little hairy hiccup, but um, for the most part, you know, you should be pretty okay. And I'll do I'll do some trimming ups later. And here I'm going to do I want to go across here. So my technique from before I'm going to want to see where my hole is. Yep, where's my last one? There we go. I want to be really careful to go across, twisting underneath. So I'm coming up at a different angle. Yep, going right across. I just want to frame out the grass. And again, that is only so I don't overshoot. Very good. Yeah, Sharon, you like a bunch, not just the Tudors, but a whole bunch. Do you, do you prefer the um, sort of British history? I go through different phases of, um, of what I like. I've been in such a phase for so long, because I guess it's because I lived abroad for such a long time and I was not happy doing that. I mean, I was for the first few years, but then not happy. Um, I got into this thing with, I just miss the U.S. so much that I just wanted everything. Like all my fiction books and everything I wanted to be set in the U.S. because it made me feel like a bit closer to home. Um, and now that's kind of shifting again because I've been home for a while. But there were years that I only listened to and read. Uh, I, I do read a lot of history, too, ever since being a tour guide. Um, I only read and listened to stuff that was, like, American. And now I'm getting more into, like, because I used to be a super Anglophile. And anything British I listened to. And, yeah, I like, I like, all, I like all kinds of history, too. And I'm glad that I feel, like, se like, settled and satisfied again enough that I can enjoy all kinds of stuff again, because I was really, in a weird way, getting my fill of like early American history. And, and when I was a tour guide, my, my specialty was really uh, like revolutionary and settlement era stuff. So that's why I talk about that era sometimes on Coffee Time, because it's always on the tip of my tongue and I really enjoy it. Um, and I think that will always probably be my favorite time in history, just because I, I remain super patriotic and proud that this this little group of states, say they weren't even states yet, managed to defeat the biggest superpower in the world. And I still am a huge Anglophile, so it's nothing against the British, but that it just is one of those underdog stories that I never get tired of. And I'm super proud of that whole moment in history. So I'm coming around the edge again, and because I am a little crazy, I have to trim a little bit, just a little bit. And then I'm going to twist underneath, and I'm going to come up here. And I feel the material playing me a little. So when it does that, I just let go, let it go back under, and pull up again. If it's going to play me, I'm just going to let it pull up uh, a second time. You see I've got some like loops hanging off here. You can clip this as you go, or you can clip them all at the end. Whatever you have to do for your mental health, right? Pick another piece. And again, I'm just defining my spaces so that I have a nice, good, straight edge. And right now, I like to hook down rather than up, so I'm just trying to figure out where this row is, and I'm dragging my hook up it so that I don't accidentally do a diagonal. And now I'm coming down, and I know it, I'm going to meet up with that piece exactly, which is what I want to do. I feel like I gave you all a different uh, color, though. I don't feel like I don't feel like I did mean for there to be black in the border. Um, I feel like the reason I left that pack out was because it was incomplete. But I'm going to make a black border because why not? I've got it sitting right here, and then I, I'm also lazy, and I don't have to stand up again. So all right, so I have that kind of fleshed out. And now I'm thinking to myself, do I want to do the same here? Do I want to do the same there? I guess so. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm going to turn over here. 
um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to follow this line exactly. So I'm following it with my eye just to make sure. I mean, I have to go through that kind of cloud of the pastel, but I just want to be sure that I come straight up on the same line because I don't want that line to jump right above and beyond. That would be a bummer. So I'm just coming up here again, and I'm twisting underneath, twisting the loop underneath to change direction. Oh, Lucinda says, hi, have to pause for, for now. Was fun. Okay. And much slower than, well, that is okay. That is okay. I bet you are doing great. And it is not a race. So you are doing great. Pick it back up later. I bet you got all the essentials. My goal, you know, here is to, is to hook this tonight. And I will easily do that. So I just didn't know how long it would take. And, of course, talking a lot is not helping. But if we don't talk, it's less fun. So... Let's see. I'm kind of measuring this line, too. I'm going to slip this sideways because I really need to know where that line is. All right, there we go. I'm sideways for just a minute, and then I'll come back to you head on because I want to be sure that these lines are perfect. Super fun. Candace, I love cozy mysteries, too. I love cozy mysteries. I listen to a whole bunch. I can never think of which ones I listen to, but usually I listen to like a whole series. Um, there's one set on Cape Cod, like the Cape Cod Caper or whatever. The girl owns a bike shop. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's very murder she wrote. Like there's just a ridiculous amount of crime. on. I think it's set on Martha, Martha's Vineyard. Um, but I like that series. I listen to all of them. And I think the same writer, I think it's the same writer, wrote a series that's set in... I'm going to say like Alabama, something like that. Mystery is still, cozy mystery still. And um, and I like that series too. I Now that I think of it, I had, haven't checked lately to see if um, she put new ones out. And I bet she did because it's been like a couple years since I... And, and I'm trying to think of the names on those two. The ones that are set in the South. That woman owns, in the other series by the same author, she owns like a cafe. It's like a breakfast cafe. Um, and I think her husband's name is Abe. And, yeah, there's all kinds of crazy crime that happens in town. I'm just keeping going with this just for a minute because I know I have to do it anyway, and I still have a thread, a, a, a tail active, so I thought, why not? I'm just coming up to meet the orange because I want it to be, yeah, pretty exact. That looks good. Yeah, this one is a bit rough. And I'm going to come shooting. I'm going to trim it a lot later. You know, I'm not sure. Yep. That's it. Just making sure my line is straight. That's always one of my great preoccupations, making sure my lines are straight. And I will trim like crazy later because it is, it's pulling up, a. it's like a bit of a hairy pull up. Yeah, I do. I love mysteries. I remember when I was, um, I must have been 17, but I was applying for college at Marymount College in Terrytown, the all, was an all-girls school, and I was being interviewed by nuns, which was well within my uh, comfort zone, right, from coming up in Catholic school. And, um, yeah, you know, um, I remember she asked me a bunch of questions. Obviously, it was an interview. And she asked me, I wasn't expecting, what kinds of books do you read? And at that time, I was reading, like, the Agatha Christie's for the second or third time, like, all of them. Because um, I love those, and I love the Dorothy Sayers, and I love, um, I love like the um, um, sort of 1940s, 1950s era detective story. Um, I love, I like P.G. James too. She's newer, but I also love her. Um, but the, you know, I, I was, I was reading a lot back then, and, and the nun loved that I answered that way because she said I also love murder mysteries and I thought you like murder mysteries you're a nun what like are, aren't you not supposed to like murders but she said I love them because with a mystery you not only are reading just a story right like you would pick up a book and read a story but you're reading a story with a puzzle embedded in it and she said it feels like an extra level of interest and intellect to be listening reading you know reading reading the story but also solving the mystery putting all the clues together and I thought, that is so neat. I never thought of it like that. And I thought, I'm so glad that I said that, you know. Because as soon as I said it, I thought, oh, I should have said I love cl reading classics, you know. 
I'm reading uh, James Joyce, but I'm very glad I didn't because then I might have been called out on that too, and I that would have been very bad. So I'm just filling in. I was filling in a little bit of the black. I think I want to fill in a little bit of the black just because I just want to know that's done because when I flip over, it's going to be our last step. Um, and I just want to be sure that, that this part is done. Kinta said, if you decide to do British ones again, there is the Mrs. Jeffries series set in the Victorian era. There are 41 of them. Now, who is the author on that? Is that Anne Perry or is that somebody, somebody else? Because I don't think I know those. Um, yeah, I love I love Victorian mysteries. Like love, love, love them. I'm trying to think, I feel like there was a Victorian mystery series that I was digging into lately too. I'm trying to think of what that would be. I do love a good mystery. I've hardly been reading at all. I have to admit, you know, with the kids and um, still doing like the co sleeping with the kids, particularly with Teddy because he's got so many phobias with his autism, um, hardly ever get, you know, quiet. But um, it's also, I have to say, it's also nice to cuddle with the little ones. Like when I'm with my daughter Jocelyn at night, she doesn't like it when the light is on, so I tend not to read. And sometimes I think, God, I'm laying in my own bed. Can I not read a book? You know, I'm 51 years old. Can I not read a book? When I, but then I think, oh, but it's also so nice to scratch her little back, you know, her little baby back. She's like a little powder puff. She loves to get the scratchies, and she loves it when I play with her hair, and I think it won't be always, right? I, I'd rather do that right now and listen to my book cassettes during the day, I guess. But some of the stuff I liked um, is not on book cassette. Like when I went to Cape Cod the last time, there was a lady, I'm pretty sure I told you this on Coffee Time, inside the Wellfleet Flea Market. She has a stall there, and she also works in a little cafe, cafe there. It's like like a drive-in movie theater but there's also a flea market like five days a week and she's an author and she's written a ton of books and they they are uh, books about a ghost who's like kind of sounds like casper but kind of a friendly ghost helpful ghost and it all ties into it's, these historical stories kind of tie into um these broader stories overarching story about this guy who's setting up a a cafe on cape cod um, change direction after being a lawyer and does this but it, I've only started her series because it's a large series and they it, what I've read so far is excellent because you always wonder if it's going to be like really corny you know and it's actually excellent and, and it wouldn't be on audible because it's you know very very small local author and I bought all I bought the whole series I bought not only the whole series but there was a second series that she'd written that were a bit different Oh, Emily Brightwell. Oh, I don't know her, Candace. I'm definitely going to have to... 41 is great. I'm definitely going to have to look those up. Um, but yeah, I'm, I was really into reading those too, and I'll just have to read them when I have a bit more time. Um, but what I liked about the mysteries that I was listening, to, reading from the girl on Cape Cod was she always includes recipes. And some like sometimes there, there's an author... What's her name? I think Claudia Bishop. I think that's the name. She wrote books maybe 20 years ago that were set at a bed and breakfast in New York. I'm thinking like Hudson area, like um, Croton on Hudson, that kind of area. And they were excellent. And it was about two sisters who opened this B&B in Hemlock Falls. I think it was called Hemlock Falls. And, of course, there would constantly be deaths, like with the guests and things. But they would um, often have a recipe that was important, like to the story at a certain juncture of the story. And then at the end of the book, they would include the recipe. And I mean, this was a long time ago. So it was like one of the first examples I can remember of people adding a recipe. Now everybody adds a recipe to the back of the book, which is kind of like, I mean, it's always cute, you know, but it's a lot. And okay, these are on Hoopla Digital. You know, I have I have Hoopla and Audible because my library does Hoopla audiobooks. And yeah, not everybody has Hoopla, but if you like listening to audiobooks and you don't have Audible, which is like, you know, prime or, or not, but expensive. Um, yeah, your library probably has a deal with one of these book systems. Hoopla is one of them, but there are others. And, you know, you can often take out like three books a month on, on audio and listen to them from your computer. And it just takes a little bit of setting up. It's, I mean, even I figured it out. So, you know, you know, it's like, it's really for everybody. If I could play a story on my computer from the library, um, it's obviously not hard because I can barely turn the computer on. So I'm still working my way across with the border here. I think I'm doing pretty well. 
and it is a snaggly material so I know the back isn't going to look that great. You'll see that in a minute when I pop it over to do the punch in. I'm just feeling, doing the dental, the dental sweep here, feeling for where there might be some gaposis. I wonder what you all have for uh, dinner tonight. If you got stuff on or if you got stuff for later. Thinking about it because I'm getting hungry. I've been trying to eat a bit healthier lately. Um, my friend John, who's at the Creation Station where I go to work on the book every week, is getting me into this like um, gluten-free, at least sometimes, not all the time, because I am a massive pig, but at least sometimes. And I, I feel like I immediately lost a bunch of weight just from not chowing down on pasta and bread all day um, and it's kind of like it's the low hanging fruit because it's there and it's easy to heat up and it's fast and I'm always in a hurry that's the thing and it's not a good way to be for any part of your health but yeah it's kind of like this past week I've just been doing like 99% gluten free and I feel like I dropped quite a bit of weight pretty fast and it feels good so why not right I'm not big on fad diets and stuff like that at all, but I've been hearing a lot about gluten-free and different things that people try, and I thought, um, yeah, let me give it a shot, because I don't have time every single day to go to the gym, nor do I want to. I mean, I never want to. Oh, sure thing, Kara. It is fun. And this is a small pattern. I don't know if every month I'll show it from the beginning and stuff. We'll have to see who logs on and everything. Because um, we spent almost, well, we probably spent 45 minutes at the beginning getting set up. And I can go faster. I mean, I can definitely hook this thing in two hours. But, yeah, I've had this sort of completionist mentality when I got started that I wanted to show you everything. And I, as usual, like as with the shows and everything, I didn't know how long it would take. Um, I didn't want you to feel sort of gypped. So I thought, let me add a few things. But it turns out we have plenty of material just sitting. I'm just going to finish this up because why not? And then I'm going to flip over and punch the other two. Now, I don't expect you to have a punch. Um, I just, I, I knew that I wanted to, I'm going to take away my needle nanny because I don't really need, need her right now. Um, I don't expect you to have a punch. It's just I know some of you are interested in punch or you are punchers. And I know some of you are interested in the eternal question, can I hook and punch the same piece? And the answer is always absolutely you can, but I'm going to show you how to, if that makes the most sense. I'm going to come around the side here. And I'm twisting. Whenever I make corners like that, I twist, I twist to the side because I really want it to sit nice and proper. And yeah, this is pretty much the most difficult material that I have ever hooked, but as you can see, it's still hooking. You, you have to just do, do the battle with the material when it's not ideal. It is making a lovely um, color. Like it's got little flecks of that red in it, like the fox color in it. It is doing lovely, lovely things. It's maybe hard to tell on the camera because it just looks dark, but there's lots of little colors in there and they really are pretty. It is a mess maker of a thing too. I'm gonna need to get some tape out later because I've got it over the arm of the green and white couch and um, it's making it really hairy and wooly and gross, you know, linty, linty. Dave, there you are. <laughs> what did I miss? Just finished a bowl of popcorn with real butter and salt. Did not even offer to share. See, that makes me crazy hungry. That makes me crazy and it makes me want popcorn. But when I get popcorn, I have to I have to really go to the movie theater. Have, does, have you noticed, is it the same at your movie theaters lately where when you get the popcorn, they let you put your own butter on? This is like a new evolution. I know this is just another like layer of laziness on the part of like customer service and how to like make everything robotic or have the customer do it themselves so they don't have to pay as many people. But lately when I go to the movie theater with the kids, because when I go, I'm pretty much definitely seeing a kid's movie. So it's like, not only do I need an actual drink, just because it's I'm just not that big into cartoons and stuff. They're usually better than I think, but you know. Um, they also have popcorn. And lately, they've been wanting you to do your own kind of 
um, work on the popcorn. And I actually prefer that because then you get under there with the butter, right? And you put it, you do a little bit of popcorn and then you do a layer of butter and then you do a little bit of popcorn and another layer of butter. And this is how life should be, obviously. So I like that a lot. This is a, some things I feel like, are you kidding me? I'm at Home Depot and I, in this vast place, I cannot find a single employee. And in those situations, I think, man, like customer service is, is, is over. It's just like, it's not a thing anymore. But in some ways, like with the butter your own popcorn, um, I think, well, I kind of like, I kind of like this angle. There are some perks to, to this. What is the world going to be like in a few years though, when my kids are older? You know, what kind of jobs are there going to be for people? Everything is like being taken away so quickly. You don't even have time to think about it or complain about it. It's just gone. You know, even at like, you know, we go to McDonald's and stuff once in a while. It's like they want you to order your stuff instead of ordering it with the person. They want you to order it on the computer. And it's like, man, could I hit the wrong button one more time? And then, you know, feel the need to like kick the machine like literally over. It's it, the chances of like hitting the wrong button and then you can't find the backspace. And it's like, seriously, can somebody who's working here just take my order? Which is usually what we end up with because um, I'm nice for a few. I'm nice for a few minutes because I'm nice. I think I think I'm nice. Um, but after a few minutes, it's kind of like, guess what? Not nice anymore. And I start to lose it. So just fooling with the eye a little bit. Um, yeah. And when I'm not nice, I'm really not nice. You know, that's hard to imagine, huh? But once you, once you push me far enough, yeah, not nice. I was not nice at Staples the other day. That's for sure. I mean, I went in there to have some stuff printed and, um, and she wanted me to like go back home and put an online order in for something I wanted to add, despite the fact that I had just emailed them like all of the documents and they had them all at the store. They had them all as files. She wanted me to go drive back home and get on my computer and start fooling around again with placing an order online because she was lazy. And oh, that didn't go, that conversation did not go well for her. It was, yeah the inner demon came out. I almost needed an exorcism like, you know, at Staples because it was like, whoa, not happening. Bad news, not happening. Let me talk to your manager. <laughs> it's just really bad. Really bad. Getting there with this. We're getting there. Janelle, I think you're smart to refuse because it is really aggravating and you make mistakes. It happened to me the other night when we were coming home from New York City. We stopped at one of the gas stations that had um, Dunkin' Donuts in there. And I have never seen this at Dunkin' Donuts, but it's the same thing. They want you to order while the guy is just standing there staring off into space or on his phone, right, one or the other. And I'm like, "There's it's 930 at night, right? I only want a coffee. And it, it took me like 10 minutes to try to figure out, I wanted like a chai or something, so not exactly a coffee, what page it was on. And meanwhile, this guy is just standing there and I, and eventually I said, excuse me, like I'm really struggling here. I got no sense of humor at this time of night. I'm tired, I've been in Manhattan with kids all day. I need a coffee like now. And then he flipped the machine around to show me where the buttons were. None of them were intuitive. Like none of it made sense. Like where the chai was, was not the same page as the coffee or the hot drinks. It was like on its own, you know, it was under like the shoe section or something. It wasn't, but you know what I mean? Totally not intuitive. And I thought, seriously, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be exhibiting some bad behavior often if this is the way that things are going. Cause it's not just them forcing you to use like their technology. And by the way, like just as a side note, it is like super sick cold season season and still COVID time. It's like I don't necessarily want to be rubbing my hands all over a machine that a hundred other people have used today. Like that, there's that little detail. But on top of that, it's like employees standing there while struggle, struggles are happening with customers is just, yeah, it's hard to take. It's hard to take. And I worked at Dunkin' Donuts when I was young. When I was in high school, I worked at Dunkin' Donuts senior year. You can imagine how cool that was, right? It wasn't cool at all, but um, I did it. And I made enough money to go to London by myself. And it was fine. I bought a you know, crappy hotel in Covent Garden. 
and cruised around for a month after working at Dunkin' Donuts all year. It was great. It was a good experience. It was a good use of tips. And I'll tell you, in those days, we lived in fear of the mystery shopper, who they were always threatening us with, who it would be. You know, that one customer who comes in who's not one of your regulars, you're thinking, oh, my God, it's the mystery shopper. Is my hat on right? <laughs> Is my visor on right? Oh, it's so, it was so stressful. But in those days, you didn't untuck your shirt. You didn't walk around without your visor on. You just didn't. There were rules and, you know, yeah. You didn't break them. You just didn't. You didn't want to lose your job. It's very different now. It's really different. And I just feel like people who work at a lot of customer service places, restaurants and stuff, are super insolent. And I'm thinking, wow. Either I'm getting old and I'm losing, completely losing my sense of humor or um, this generation of, of kids is just really, really out there. Bold as brass. So I'm getting to the home stretch here and then we're going to do flipsies. Looks like we've probably got another 15, 20 minutes in us because the punching goes really fast. And this is a messy nessie for sure, this one. But... As I say, I do like the way it's coming out. Lots of colors in it under the light. It's got, it's got a little bit of forest green. It's got a little bit of the russet red. It's got a little bit of like a honey mustard color, tiny bit of like maybe a denim blue, and then like the, obviously the black, the brown. Lots of flecks of color, really pretty. And I am still staying in line even though I'm filling in because uh, it's the border and I'm always a bit more careful in the border with my straight lines and all that. And I'm anticipating filling in both the landscape part and the sky part with the punch needle. And the, for me, the nature of punch needle, because I'm not great at it, is it got to be real careful to keep it straight. And it can't be straight if these lines are intruding on those parts of the composition. So I, I can't allow that to happen. I've got to be really careful. Just a little bit left here and here. Oh, so I came up with an, a design for the next hook along that I hope you like. It's a little bit different. Um, well, of course it's different. It's going to be, it's a weeping willow tree. I'll, I'll get it out there tonight. It's a beautiful weeping willow tree. Very simple design. It's a circle set within a square. And uh, very simple, very pretty. Bit of a willow plate design, but it's going to be all, for the most part, yellows. Many, 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 many shades of yellow. So not expected, you know, as the blues. Of course, if you like the pattern and you want to get it and hook it with me, but you don't want it as a kit, that's always possible if you're like, I like it, but I want a brown willow tree or I want blue willow pattern like dishware. Of course, that's always possible. But I have a bunch of yellows that I'm just dying to use, and I thought, I'm going to use it for that. And at the bottom of each sort of branch, and there's not many, there's maybe six or eight, I'm going to make a penny, like a penny rug penny, and have them hanging at the bottom of the willows. So in that next class, I'm going to hook up the willow tree and or it's not class, it's just really time together, hook along. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hook up the willow tree and then I'm going to um, add the pennies. I'll probably pre-sew a couple of the pennies to, to show you stitching them on, but I'll stitch a couple in the, in the time too. So that if you're trying to do it with me and watch my hands, you can do that too. Oh, Candice, good to see you. It was a lot of fun. I will see you soon. It's a long time to sit together, but I figure it's a hook along. It's like a dance. It's like a dance a thon, isn't it? <laughs> I've never done a dance a thon. I don't think I could handle it. Reminds me of Happy Days, you know, all those shows where people are falling asleep, like leaning against their partner. It sounds like a nightmare. What could possibly be worth that? Well, cash, right? Cash would be worth it, but not a trophy. I think that was the end. Yeah, that was the end of that. So you pull it up and cut it. And when I turn it over, you're going to see what a pig's breakfast this black was. And you know why I don't care? Because on the front, it looks good. Really like it. Really like it on the front. So I'm going to flip it over for you again. And I'm going to trim this out a little bit later. I've only got my two sections left. Aw, he's so cute. He looks so cute. Now get ready for the horror show. Here we go. So, you see all these bits and pieces hanging off? 
managed to um, deal with them on the front just with my hand as I went and that was not hard but on the back I might trim them a little bit I think I'll probably trim them a little bit I'm not gonna go nuts though because you don't really see them you see this big abomination that's the tail that I left up right and I chose to leave that tail up because I really wanted the eye exactly that way and I was afraid if I trimmed it or if I pulled through the tail it would slightly change the shape of the eye and change that little whimsical glimmer so didn't want to do that what I am going to do here is I'm going to trim the pieces that are close to the areas I'm about to punch because if I pull onto one of these it might pull out some loops right so these are all things that I think about while we're working I'm going to and you know I don't think about this in advance if I had I wouldn't have put this material in there I admit it but I'm just trimming it out here so I know I can get there with my punch needle now I don't think that you're punching this with me I mean I don't think you are um, but I want to be sure I don't make any big stupid mistakes so yeah so let me punch the rest of this let's see how this goes make sure it's good and stretched and Oh, so the only thing I need to worry about, right, because my with punch I'm doing it in reverse. Where'd my Sharpie go? There it is. The only thing I need to worry about is dum dum that I am. Hang on, we gotta rewind. My lines, right? I have a line here. Let me show you. I have a line here and here, right? And I don't see them on the back. So I need to transfer them. So what I'm going to do is just makeshift. I'm holding it up to my light. Hold on. Got my Sharpie out. I'm holding it up to my lamp. And I can see the lines through the lamp. So I'm adding the line to the back of the material. So I'll show you what I just did. You can hold, hold your piece up to a window or whatever. You can hook and punch um, the same piece, right? You can do hooking and punching on the same piece. But if you do that, you have to remember that your drawing's only on one side. So to get those lines in, you're going to have to put it up to the light or, or flip it over like I did or whatever, just to get those simple lines in. So I just needed those two lines to be happy and to be able to proceed. What punch needle to use, right? I've got the Amy Oxfords, these big ones here. I think I'm going to go for, I still like the one that I sell the most, right? The um, Mercado de Hacienda. Um, I think for this one, I will need the Oxford though. You know, I think I do need the Oxfords because I think these are just a bit thicker. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for the Oxford. Um, I'm going to go for the Peacock just because it's prettier. Right? And I do have my washers and I'm going to put a washer on. And again, I don't think you're punching, but I'm, I'm finishing it up this way. So we'll see how it goes. I'm not the best puncher at all. And using these different um, heights of washer gives me a different height of loop, right? It changes the height. So just coming to the beginning of this guy here and I'm gonna thread him up right through the hole and pull him back in. And I think I'm gonna put one washer on because I don't want it like super, super high pile. So the washer goes right over my yarn. Let's do it. So this was supposed to be, that's my stomach going crazy. This is supposed to be the bottom. All right, so let me come over here. And I'm going to go fast here. Um, and then we'll turn it over and see how it looks. I'm a big packer with punching, I have to say. And I try to be better, you know. Amy Oxford is one of my buddies. I, I do pay attention to what she says, what she writes, what she does. Um, I just, I struggle a little bit more with punch. And punch for me is a little bit more technical. Um, so I kind of, um, instinctively shy away from it, but it's fun to do. It's fast to do. And I do often do it because, because I have a business, right? I have to do things that I don't, that aren't my absolute favorite, but I'm getting better at it and faster at it and being real careful as I go across, I'm being careful to go really straight, right? because um, I've got lines to consider and I'm being really careful to keep that yarn away from my hand because um, if it gets caught up on my body, in my armpit, in the couch, it's not going to go free flowing anymore and we're going to have a problem. Um, it'll catch and pull and yeah, we got enough. 
to think about without that. I was going to say we have enough problems, but we really don't. This is going real well. Coming back around, probably doing a little bit of packing here. And unlike other uh, teachers I know, I don't, I don't hold the punch needle in the correct position. I hold it in the position that I like, which is sideways, like either quarter past or quarter of the hour. That's how I like to hold it. Um, so everybody, I feel everybody should be able to work in the style, manner, with techniques that they like. Um, it's nice to be taught uh, different choices so you have things to choose from, but it's not nice to be told that you're doing it wrong when it's coming out fine doing it your way. That's not a thing. And don't let anybody tell you that that's a thing. If you're punching or hooking and you're doing it a different way than me or any other teacher and it's coming out fine, then you are doing it. And if it ain't broke, you don't fix it. So coming up here. I haven't checked to see what the kind of height is on this. So I guess we'll find out together in a minute. God, my stomach's going crazy. And you know, I have to say with this gluten free kind of stuff, like I'm not, I thought I'd be really hungry. I'm really, I'm very hungry right now. Um, but it's been a really long time since I ate. So I'm not surprised, but I thought I'd be more hungry. I thought I'd be miserable. You know, I thought I'd be really miserable. Um, and breaking into the peanut M&Ms. And it really hasn't been like that. Remember that diet thing that people used to say in the 80s? Nothing feels as good. Nothing tastes as good as being thin feels. I think about that all the time and I think that didn't help at all. Like that just makes me want to eat more Doritos. I don't know why, but that just, that is not a slogan that ever helped me um, stop overeating or eating garbage food. You can see I'm coming to kind of the end of this here. So I'm going around in circles until I can't do any more. I think I can't do any more. So let me cut this. Now I can pull these pieces through with the hook if I want to. I'm just going to finish up over here. I'm tempted to peek because it might be awful. It might really seriously be awful. Like, honestly, I have done punching before and looked at it and gone, oh, seriously. But it also might be fine. I'm going to, I'm hoping for fine. Like if I could just make a deal right now with like whoever, the devil, I would say, yeah, I'm okay with it not being brilliant, but let's make it be fine. I'm good with fine. You know, I wear like a size medium. Um, everything being kind of fine for me is perfect. Oops. Oh, yeah. Always have to be careful with um, your punch needle. Particularly monk's cloth, I feel, because it's very easy to rip a hole through it. I didn't, but I have seen students do it when I've been teaching punch, and it's like, wow, um, that's exquisite. How did you do that? Of course, I never say that, but sometimes it's like, wow, that's a hole. All right, so now that part's done. I'll flip it over at the end. So I'm going to get rid of this, and I'm going to go to my last color, which is this lilac color, and... Let's get this through the needle and do the sky. And then we'll do a flip over and see what we've got. I'm taking my washer off again. I want to keep it at the same height. Now this could be, you know, you do this however you want. If you feel like I want it to be on even heights, then do the washer, don't do the washer, do two washers, right? These are called O-rings and I get them at, um, I get them at the local hardware store, not Home Depot, only because um, for some reason, Home Depot doesn't always stock every size of O-ring. And um, the people at the local hardware store are way more likely to, like, deal with me bringing in a punch needle and trying to fit an O-ring on it. Whereas at Home Depot, they're like, you know, first of all, if you, you can't find them. If you find them, that in itself is, like, a bit eerie. And on top of that, um, yeah, they don't really want to help you solve your problems. They just want to tell you what aisle to go to. It's frustrating. So my thing is coming undone because I'm not being careful. So let me get that going again. This afternoon, um, my stupid engine light went on. I just remembered that. So I guess I'll have to go to Firestone in the morning and see 
the, the guys are so good at Firestone. They're always so nice to me. Um, the car's been okay in general. I have a Kia Soul. It's been pretty good. They changed the engine on it because of recalls and stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, you just don't like to see that engine light coming on. And I know sometimes, um, you know, it's atmospheric, whatever. But I'm thinking, oh, please don't be like some big, huge, horrific project. Coming up here with this, and my, my yarn is snagging a little bit, so I had to pull it. Because, again, when you're punching, um, if your loops aren't staying, it's probably one of two things. It's either your yarn is snagging somewhere, like it doesn't have free range, um, or you lift it up too far with your tip. If you notice with my tip, I don't lift up at all. It's just straight down. Like it, I scrape along the edge. I, I scrape the edge of the tip along the backing fabric, and I don't lift up at all, like not a hair. A, a hair could not fit between the point and the backing fabric. And then I turn, just like I do with my hooking, I turn the needle in my hand because I like it at quarter of or quarter past the hour. That's how I like to hold it. So I keep turning it to make sure that I'm in one of those positions because that's what feels good for me. And I loosen up my yarn again because I know how that goes. The frame is hitting against the little tray table where I have, where I have you. It's very pretty on the back, and I and I twist again in my hand, right, clockwise. And this is something that I do. This isn't something that you must do. It might be something that do, has absolutely no benefit for you, but for me, I like I like to twist like that, and I have more success that way. And I teach it that way too when I'm out. Now, see, a little black thing came up there. I don't know if that was sitting on the surface or if I pull that out. Well, there's no black near me, so I guess that was just kind of hanging out. We are on a very big home stretch now. Crazy home stretch times. So when I finish this, I'll show you the front and then we'll log off pretty quick. Because as you can tell, I'm just backing up because I want to do one more loop here. Um, I need to eat some foodies before I get hangry. There. All right. And. This is really the home stretch. Well, actually, there's two more little parts, right? Well, let me do this one first. And I'm being real conscious, as usual, of my line, right? Keeping that straight liner around the border is a huge thing for me. That is a looming large, in my mind, kind of a thing. Gosh, this is fun. If it comes out okay, I'll be really happy. Because it's really fun, and look at how fast it's uh, coming together. You know, I wouldn't have done the punching first because I would have needed to transfer a lot of lines earlier since the lines aren't on this side. But having said that, um, you know, I always, when I plan to hook and punch in the same project, um, I always make sure, oh, I'm running low. Let me see how far this goes. That's crazy. I didn't think I was that low. Um, when I, and I am I, packing. I am definitely packing. Don't you pack. I'm packing. Um, but it's not, obviously it's not ideal. Um, I always figure out where I'm going to punch. So like, I know it's an area where this is super packing what I'm doing right now. Like this is ridiculous, but I'm still doing it. We'll see how it looks. Um, I always choose an area that's kind of a fill in area that I've already outlined the rest of it. Do you know what I mean? So I can't really go outside the lines or screw up too badly because I've already outlined like everything around it, right? It's all, this is just a weird amoeba of a jigsaw puzzle. Everything else is outlined. Ooh, wait a minute, I went right up into that frame. Let's not do that. All right, let's see. These odd shapes around this woolly border. Very nice, very fun. I have to say, I love the colors for this piece. I was trying to put them together and do something really different, you know, that was a bit springtime, but not like too low hanging fruit, like all spring colors. Um, and I wanted to do a combination of yarn and wool. For those of you who haven't hooked with yarn before, I thought, well, that's gonna be fun. Um, and I, 
and I, you know, didn't really know until, I'm going to back up one, didn't really know until we got going. Um, you put the, you put the colors together on the table and it's like, oh, that's nice. But until it, they start to go into place, sometimes it, it, it's like, you know, comes together like the angels singing. Um, I really like these colors. I am looking at my Foxo and I'm thinking, do I want to pull out the black border and put more of a wine color in or like a dusty rose? You know me with the dusty rose, right? I can never get enough dusty rose. I don't know that I'll be able to take the time to do it, but I would love to see some dusty rose in here. It's good to answer some questions today. You know, even if you are like a super experienced hooker puncher it's good to answer questions and talk things out out loud because there's always more ways there's always more ways than one and it's good to talk about what all the different possibilities are because sometimes like we were saying you you have a way and um and you choose your way and you forget the other ways that are also possibilities and as soon as you shut your mind down to that you don't necessarily remember that there are other choices until somebody reminds you so that's what something like today is good for is we'll talk about, you know, we talked about different ways of doing stuff. And if my ways are different than yours, and maybe it jogs your memory and you're thinking, oh, I used to do it like that. Maybe I'll give that a go again. You know, maybe I stopped because it was like a bit too hard at the beginning. And now I've got some traction and better hooker puncher. Um, maybe it would work again, you know. So, and yeah, all these little ends are sticking up like crazy. But um, I will drag those through later with the hook. And you don't have to do that. I just, I bring them forward with a hook. I bring them to the surface uh, and I trim them to the same height, the same pile as the rest of the piece. And we are really on the home stretch now. I think I'm about to do our last loop. That was it. So I'm, I have to admit, I'm pretty nervous. I'm going to let you see it first. Oh, it doesn't look good. It's too high. Dang it. Leave it to me, right? Well, let's see. Let me bring the camera here. Yeah, I should have put two washers on it, I think. Um, you know, in this light, because it is getting darker now, um, yeah, the, back, the loops are a bit higher than the rest of it is. Still really cute, though, isn't it? And... And punching through brought up some of the black tails from the black. Quite, I quite like it, actually. Let me see. Let me get you straight on here. And let me blast this. He's quite cute, isn't he? But you see how the loops are a bit higher. So, yeah. I do like, I do like the combination of the loops and the punched loops. It is quite different, but I feel like around his head, I should have punched lower because, um, yeah, I feel like it's just a bit overwhelming, but it is what it is. That's my thing, and I don't think you were punching anyway. You see the kind of height difference there? It's pretty, though, isn't he pretty? I think he's quite pretty. He's a little sweetheart. All right, well, that is that. And my back, I'm ready. I'm ready for a stretch. And I'm ready for a meal. Here, let me show you in the regular light now. Maybe it makes a difference. A little bit. And of course, um, he's all wool, so I could block him with a with a steamer. I think he's cute too, Janelle. Thanks, Chrissy. I think he's cute. Yeah, I think I screwed up with the heights for the punching. But I'm not going to cry myself to sleep about it. I'm really not. And I really like him himself. He's really sweet. So that was fun. I really enjoyed that. I think I needed that at the end of the weekend. I really do. I think I needed um, to just sit and have some time together and chat and joke about some stuff and, um, and work on a little piece like this. Yeah, he's good. He's good. I'm, ha I'm happy with him. And if you have this piece and you are really struggling with the black, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was quite so tricky. We thought that this color was tricky. The black is way trickier. You could always switch out the border right, for something you have or yarn or shoelaces, just get some shoelaces. This was quite hard to hook. So I'm sorry about that. It didn't seem that hard when I was cutting it and planning it. And I thought all those colors are really interesting, but it was, it was a bit tricky. So if you are approaching this later, you might want to think about that because 
um, it might really play you. Or it might be that my that I forgot to add a color because I feel like I did for my kid. I feel like I was one color short. Um, so just see how it goes. Let me know. And if you if you finish your piece, make sure you post it. I really want to see your piece too. This is really pretty down here, these pieces. Otherwise, I just panicked. I was thinking, I have an episode tomorrow, but I'm ready for it. Um, an episode of cocktail uh, coffee time in the morning because we're finishing up our cooking magazine and we're finishing up some stuff that we had for the show on Friday cocktail night. So I will see you tomorrow, Monday morning at, um, well, noon Eastern Standard Time. This was super fun. I'll get the willow pattern out. So if you enjoyed this, you could sign up again. Angel says, I was so happy I was able to be part of the adventure tonight. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you were there too. It was super fun. And it just goes to show, I mean, I know I've been hooking and punching for a while. So, um, you know, I maybe I do it faster than you and, and it's not a race and who cares. But it just goes to show, you know, even if you are um, not working fast at all, who cares? But also, you can't get a project done in a reasonable amount of time. I mean, you definitely can. People think that this takes forever. Small pieces like this, if I wasn't talking and I was just hooking, this would have easily been an under two-hour project for me. Maybe for you, three hours. Maybe four hours, you know. Um, but, yeah. And Jean, I saw uh, Joss did an amazing pattern. She did. And, you, and Jean said, just trim it down if it's too high. You know, that's a great idea. I could trim down the loops, right? I totally could trim down the loops because they're high. And then you get like a clipped surface. I could absolutely do that so that particularly around his ears. I might do that around his ears. Maybe I'll do a video of that just because I feel like it's um, kind of obscuring the little points to his ears that we worked hard on. And it's obscuring that cloud a little bit on the side. So maybe I will do a bit of a clippy, a localized clippy with that. I, that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, yes, I was wondering about the washers, too. Oh, what was the question about the washers? Did I miss that? Um, oh, about whether my, maybe you were wondering if my washers were too many. They were, they were um, it was not enough, right? I had the one on. There's probably a reason, and I forgot, because this is a number eight regular punch. Um, I had two on, remember, and I took them off and I only put one back. I should have I should have known myself that two is better for me because I know the height that I hook at because I'm, because I'm me. I know the height I hook at. I should have known there was a reason why I had two washers on there that I, I really needed to hook lower. So I just haven't used the peacock punch for a while, so I forgot, but all right. Oh, you're so welcome, Chrissy. I was wondering about the washers. Uh, fun design, lovely hooking. It was super fun, Linda. It was great seeing everybody. I hope I caught all the comments. Oh my gosh, there's a bunch more comments. I am so sorry. Um, Doreen, he's so cute. That's in a, that was a lot of fun. That really was a lot of fun. You are so welcome. Dave, it was great to see you. S smash the thumbs up. I love it when you say that. I loved it too, Gail. That was super fun. We'll do it again next month. A nice long project like this with the, with the Weeping Willow. I will see you tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for spending some time with me, too. It really, really was fun.